first time since 2019. Um, it really is just a, a real pleasure to be here and to have everyone here. And thank you all for making this trip. It's, it really is great. Um, the, the plan for this week is to, uh, when we, we've got the re renewal, just to give you a little background for the R25 that we are so grateful for that funds this project, we had this brilliant idea that we would do every other year sort of intro in advance, intro in advance. And the first year of, the, um, of that, uh, we got hit with COVID and we were out um, uh, for since that was um, uh, supposed to be 2020 and we haven't been in person since. So now we're kind of like rolling everything else up into one now. Um, hopefully some folks have had a chance to see some of the online things, the silver lining of the cloud, um, uh, if you will, of all the COVID was we have a great sort of you know, resource now of video presentations that people should help themselves to at any time. Um, but we're now in year four of a five-year renewal, and so we're gonna cram all of those sort of, of pieces into one week. Um, no, seriously though, the plan to today is assuming that most people are for this week is this is the first of our intermediate slash advanced sort of program. It's largely that most experience And if today is for, <laughs> so you're going to get the world's fastest introduction to networks um, uh, slash um, uh, you know, reminder of what network analysis is about. And uh, that will allow you largely me. And then we're going to introduce you, introduce you a little bit to some tools and practices. And so Leanne is going to give some work um, on, show on, on introducing people to R who have not used it before, or reminding those of you who've used it infrequently, um, some of the tools that come out of network analysis. And then we're going to show you in, um, a little bit of self-bragging. We have a new project called IdeaNet, which is a software tool we're developing to try to make all of this work easier to do. And so we will show you what that project is like and um, hopefully get some of your feedback on how to make it better. So that's kind of the plan for today. Over the course of this week, we have um, roughly around some themes. for the first half of the day. And we're gonna talk about different ways in which you might collect data, video data, um, and sort of general survey types of things. And then we're gonna talk a bit about description. So data and description are gonna be largely what the day is. The afternoon will be community detection and things like this. Um, and then on Wednesday, we're gonna really focus in on implementation and experimental methods for um, networks and health. And so we have a, a wonderful um, a morning set up with a panel of people who have really done you know, the get your hands dirty kind of work of implementing interventions for health using network tools. And so um, there'll be one uh, series of, of presentations that, that Tom Valente um, uh, is, Tom Valente and Nina and um, uh, Yamel will be part of, and that will uh, be focusing um, really squarely on the health side. And then the, after, the second session will be um, on uh, field experiments or lab experiments. And so the first one is on implementation in the health series. The second panel is on experimental methods with networks. And then the afternoon is going to be spent um, talking more about different kinds of models of networks. So how do we deal with you know, what, what is the, the theory and ideas for, for pushing um, networks of health into the world? So we'll talk about peer influence there. We'll talk about um, uh, some uh, ideas of roles and role networks and things like this. And then on Thursday is our stats day. So you got two days to warm up your mathematical pens and remind yourself what a standard deviation is. And uh, then we'll end up um, coming in on Thursday and I will give us a brief primer on, brief, probably an hour and a half or so, um, review of what statistical methods are and we'll go through all of those. And then it'll be a great day because I think there's been a lot of new things that have happened since, a minute, since I saw many of you last time. Uh, in this course with respect to the exponential random graph modeling framework. Um, they've been having an entirely new syntax and it's, it's uh, generalized now to many more sort of applications that you can use, either as a generative feature for simulations or as an estimation feature for thinking about things. And we'll get to learn some new um, ideas throughout the day. And then the final day on Friday, we'll have another half, a half day in the morning to complement the day and that'll largely be centered around um, thinking about this notions of um, uh, uh, diffusion, particularly the disease context. So we have, we're lucky to have Sam Jensis in, and he's gonna talk a bit about the epidemiological modeling. I'll talk about some agent-based modeling and simulation modelings for diffusion, but it's all about essentially how does a person get a bug from someone else. And so that's a big overview of it. Every day, um, except for today, we will have a lunch, and the lunch will be provided. Um, it'll come here from Panera, and um, where we will do a lunch talk. And the lunch talk is supposed to be a, a little bit different than what we normally do. 
right? And so it's supposed to be less about um, you know, sort of the, the, the bread and butter of networks and health, and more about how networks are interesting throughout the world. And there are different things we can learn about networks. And so we're really pleased um, uh, that we have, um, we'll do a, an ethics discussion tomorrow. Dana, Haney, or Dana Pasquale, who many of you know, um, uh, I think Dana's here right now. Um, uh, Dana is going to talk about data archiving, sort of generally, what do you have to do to get data stored in, in light of the new NIH requirements. And then on Thursday, Robin, who I think is here, Robin is here, is going to um, introduce us to uh, uh, networks and linguistics, which is um, just fascinating. And I, I really hope you'll all be able to stick around for that. Um, we'll have coffee sessions um, both in the morning and afternoon, just so that people can wake up <laughs> and remember where we're at. Um, I encourage you, we have posters set up here in this uh, first hallway. Uh, these are all from our, some of our returning fellows and other people that are related to DNAC. And these are just um, there really to provide conversation starters. So just have a chance to look at them and the authors and get more information on what they're, you know, what they're presenting so you can get a sense. We're going to leave them up all week and so you can, you can focus on that. If you have a poster of your own that's not up there and you want us to, to share it with us, let me know and we can find a way to get it printed for you. So that would be there. So to the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Dynamics and ICHD for funding this project, and for the Duke Population Research Institute, Dupree, who's our co-sponsor, um, with the Duke Network Analysis Center. There's a lot of Duke blue running around this, this organization, so uh, we really do appreciate um, all of the help that they've done for this. We are guests in this space of the IID, which is the Rhodes IID, is our data and information sciences group. Um, so, you know, be good guests. If, uh, if you're, we, they let us eat in here, even though we're not supposed to. So you know, if you spill mayonnaise on the floor, let us know, and we'll make sure that it gets cleaned up. But otherwise, just be responsible. Um, what other kind of housekeeping things to keep in mind? Uh, we have masks everywhere. Um, the pandemic's over. But if you feel ill, please, like you know, check us out online and don't come to class, right? Um, <laughs> please, <laughs> pretty please. Um, uh, and you know, if you feel like being in a crowd for the first time in four years, um, I appreciate a little bit. Um, uh, like I said, we have masks around, and that's perfectly acceptable as well. Um, other questions or comments on sort of general mechanics of things? I think you should treat this a bit like a Protestant congregation, right? Make sure you shake hands with somebody you haven't met. Um, uh, turn around and introduce yourself. I'm um, uh, thinking maybe sure you're going to go out to potluck later, that kind of thing. So you know, this is the kind of opportunity we're in. If, if there's, for every meeting, as Durkheim used to say, there's always a latent and a manifest function. The manifest function of this particular organization is for us to uh, get together and learn some social networks and health, but the latent function is so that uh, we all get to create a community and recognize each other as, as what we are, right? So make some new contacts, make some collaborators, learn who you're working with, and um, you know, maybe hopefully some new grants and ideas will come out of this. All right. All right, any other sort of housekeeping things to go? All right, let's jump into some actual bits and pieces of what is then. So um, I'm not, I'm gonna do all three parts of this in the next two hours um, in more or less detail. This is why I say it's gonna be the world's fastest re reintroduction uh, to social network analysis. Um, for those of you that are truly new to this, um, just you know, hold on, you'll be fine. Uh, and it'll all be, it's all recorded and it'll all be online if you want. Let's just start. So sort of started this is that there's a lot of people now that are working on networks and have been working on networks for a long time. And the um, growth in this field has been dramatic. And the networks and health side of it has gone up really fast, um, as fast as research on sort of other sorts of processes that health people spend a lot of time and concern thinking about. And NIH and NSF continue to fund this at increasing rates. And there's lots of money and lots of grants going into this. And so NIH thought it would be a good idea to provide some training to support all of this work and to provide reviewers to review some of these grants. Um, so that's the, the sort of the background. Like I said, this was going to be fast, right? So this is like all you're getting. No, that's not. I'll do a little more background. But um, that's essentially the, 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 the thing that drew us into working on this. Um, just to set a little bit of common language, for us, network analysis, social networks are not social media. So we're, there, there are some networks embedded in social media, but social networks are these human social relations that connect one person to another or a person to an organization or an animal or something like this. But there's a, a relationship mapping process. And social networks capture a set of relations that's motivated by this structural intuition that's based on graph theory. So you can think of it as applied graph theory 
Um, it's grounded in systematic empirical data and relies heavily on these computational tools. And the reason we're sort of in this room is those computational tools tend not to be taught in your standard sociology or social science or health science classes. And so the goal is to help give us a sense of what these tools are like so we can use them um, effectively. The reason we care about it is that networks have this really interesting property that instead of thinking about individuals themselves, we can think about how an individual is embedded in a community and how any effect on an individual spreads out to others. So there's this natural spillover effect. And this spillover effect with any kind of thing you tend to do in the world, we nicely ignore when we do our methods. So if you, do, if you ever try to set up a clinical trial, you have to make sure you have your control group is never contaminated by your treatment group even though you know in practice that any public health treatment you give to a particular person is they're going to talk to their family, they're going to talk about it at their job, and so forth, it's just going to spill over. So we, we set that aside artificially whenever we do research, but in practice there ha it has to exist, there has to be the spillover. What network analysis tries to do is map the spillover. We're trying to figure out like, what is the process that creates that contamination and how do we um, to use it to our benefit as opposed to have it used um, uh, as sort of treated as noise. Um, the history of the field of social networks and health is, uh, is fascinating, and Ashton Verderai and Alex Chapman and I have a nice paper, um, I think it's a nice paper, um, sort of going through a lot of this history. I encourage you to look this up at some point if you'd like. It goes into much more detail than I will here. But briefly, the idea is that um, the growth in this field is, is keyed to a set of landmark papers and a lot of landmark proverbs. And I want to just give you a brief sense of what some of those are. Probably the first founding idea that sort of pushed a lot of this work out is Everett Rogers' Diffusion of Innovations. Um, this is a, a really nice product, book because it sets the groundwork for different types of diffusion processes. And we tend to think about disease diffusion, especially for the last few years, but the idea of an innovation diffusing through a population or an idea diffusing through a population in the same way that a disease moves is a, as was actually kind of um, uh, a unique idea that, that Everett Rogers put forward. And he flipped the script a little bit and said that you don't have to think about it as something that passively moves through the population, but it's something you can actively push through a population if you understand what distinguishes an adopter from a non-adopter and how these kinds of adoption thresholds change and what we might do to influence these adoption thresholds. Within the actual sort of social networks and health idea, this was work coming out of um, Berkman et al. has really focused on the ways in which um, social integration leads directly to health. And so it's not just as things move through health, but being integrated in a social community creates a system and a, self, and a sense of support that actually leads to increased longevity. And so this had a, a this paper was, was, was a hallmark because it's marked so clearly actual changes in, in life expectancy due to integration in social settings. My own sort of entry into the world um, came from as a young graduate student working with um, a, John Potter at Rich Rothenberg on some uh, sexual network work. Um, this was where I first became exposed to much of the work on um, networks through STD and HIV. This was coming out in the late 90s. Um, the work that they were doing, the data they collected were in the early 80s. Um, John Potter is a remarkable machine in terms of data collection. And he spent many years embedded with commercial sex workers in, that doesn't sound right, but you know what I mean, as a public health worker in um, uh, Colorado Springs. And he collected some of the best data to date on detailed sexual networks and drug sharing networks in a real community. And so he, what he really did well and with Richard Rothenberg was, ex was, was demonstrate that it's possible to collect this kind of data that everyone said you couldn't do. And by so doing, it gave us insights into what the structure of those networks looked like in ways that you'd never see otherwise. This also then, once you get these kinds of data, you end up thinking about questions in new ways. And Martina Morris, about this time, introduced an idea based on these data and some other data she was collecting in Thailand at the time, of this notion of shared partners in time. And it changed the way we think about networks, not in terms of just a series of connections, but a temporal unfolding of relationships. And that temporal unfolding, it turns out, is crucial to understanding how diseases move. And it's two settings with the same contact pattern but different timing can have dramatically different spreads in disease spread. Um, of course, there's sort of, you all know Roy May now, given that all the work we've done recently on uh, the diffusion models and in Bauman's work on peer influence. I'm going to move through these quickly in the interest of time. A few others, Ad Health, StatNet, um, uh, Christakis, and Fowler probably is the most recent big picture piece that really kicked off in the popular imagination that there, you could have a network effect on health. Their argument that obesity was contagious 
um, really ticked a bunch of people off. They thought this was not a good idea. The economist threw a fit over this election idea. But the idea stuck, and it stuck because at its root, as, as many arrows as you threw at this thing, it really kind of works, and it works pretty well. And the, and the, uh, the modeling, and we've come a long way in the modeling since this paper came out, but the general idea has withstood the test of time. And moreover, you've been able to flip it around and turn it again to say that we don't just have to observe this happening passively on a network. We can introduce it to the network and help make the population better by exploiting the kinds of connectivities we see there. And I'll go through the rest of those. All right, so if you think about the ways in which this field works, one of the tricks that um, uh, Ashton and a few of other rest of us do is to do these things called text networks. And in a text network, what you have is some given paper, and it's linked to other papers by semantic similarity, by the overlap in words is the easiest way to think of it. They're weighted in various and sundry ways, but for our purposes, all that matters is that the, you have two papers are close to each other. If they have a lot of things in common, they're far apart if they don't. And if you map that out big enough, you get what we call an intellectual landscape. And so this is the intellectual landscape of social support, or of social networks and health, excuse me. And the paper I was just using that little example is right there. And then what you can do is you can look at across this landscape is not, it's not an even just spread of papers. Instead, what you see is that there are these clumps. And these clumps relate to clusters in the network. And that's not going to work. I lost my clusters. These clusters um, each sort of capture a system or a, a set of papers that are all in the same thing. So as you might expect, there's a whole cluster of papers that are studying HIV, social capital, social support. These are very big sort of gorillas in the room kind of areas. Um, but what's nice about it is once you get this kind of piece, you can ask, well, where are the methods we're learning today or this week fit across this topic space? And what's interesting is that a lot of these core papers really find their way all over the place. So something like Rogers' Diffusion of Innovations is cited at every space in this landscape, right? So whether or not you're studying influenza or you're studying social support, Rogers is important for what you do. Similarly, some of the work that Tom Valente has done on interventions um, sort of spread all over the place. Christakis and Fowler's work has been a touchstone. Similarly, with Martina Morris's work on concurrency, is clearly important to HIV, but it has tentacles that's moved out for other sorts of processes throughout the, throughout the landscape. Now, there are some things, like organizational effectiveness, that is really sort of squarely within the health systems cluster, but other things sort of move in. And Ad Health, for example, is studied in adolescence. You can do it with topics. What I want to point out, all I'm hoping you get out of this, that's where gender sort of fits. There's not much on the systematic, what I would call sort of the you know, structural sexism. You'd expect to see that over here, but it's pretty blank. That might be an opening that people could work on. Um, but generally, you, know, you find that social networks and health covers a wide range of diverse topics. And that's what I really wanted to just seed to an idea right now. Um, that's really as much of the general background as I'm going to do about sort of, I kind of assume most of us are here because we care about social networks and health. Um, but I, I, would, I would want to stop quickly just to see if there's questions or thoughts on the motivation for a workshop like this before we go on to some of the nuts and bolts. I talk fast. I think many of you have heard this joke already. Fast, but you're smart, so I assume you can listen fast. Um, if that's not true, let me know. I can but I'm pumped. All right. So, all right. Let's jump quick then to some of the backgrounds of general network theory, and those ideas are going to sort of run throughout the rest of this week. Um, when we think about doing network research, it's really not that different than you would do for any kind of research. You can think about it as this, as this basic research process. You start with a question. You then get data to answer that question. You then go into this little loop of creating metrics and figuring out what the answer is. It's called exploratory data analysis. Once you get this figured out, some kind of a model, you get the results, and you go home and do it again. So this general process is what we do for any kind of research. What's interesting about network research is that we have sort of a specific set of tasks which usually go with each of these elements, right? And so what a lot of this week will do is talk about a particular element of this. And so in the base course, we spent a lot of time talking about centrality, for example. To this, this week, we're going to really go deep into more of the modeling elements and a bit more in terms of the exploration and clustering elements. But essentially, this kind of a process works wherever you're at. 
If you really want to play with this idea and learn more about it, I, can, I would uh, like to draw your attention to a new book. Uh, Craig just left. Oh, that's too bad. Um, <laughs> Craig, man. Um, uh, we have a new book coming out on network analysis, which really takes all of these ideas, um, puts them into a, 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 what we hope is a good, clear way of, of providing an understanding of these ideas, and integrates them directly with R. So the book includes not just a text for all the text of network analysis, but also a series of integrated labs and um, R sample code that lets you do all of these analysis as you, as you go on your own. So effectively, it's this workshop um, not just limited to health, but limited to everything else. Um, and we will hopefully keep it updated um, so that your R doesn't crash. All right. So I like to think about networks essentially as two, in two different modes across multiple different levels of analysis. So the first mode is the modes are on the rows and the types of analysis or the levels of analysis are on the columns. And this distinction between connectionist approaches and positional approaches are, I think, sort of the foundational, you know, West Coast, East Coast divide, if you will, in social network analysis. And so connectionist approaches are networks as pipes. This is the idea that a network matters because of spillover effects or diffusion or something that's moving through the network takes me to somebody else. And so this is by far the biggest thing about networks that everyone knows about. It's the thing you know about because you lived through a pandemic. It's also the thing that you know about because everyone in your sort of statistical world says you can't do network analysis because your cases aren't independent of each other. The errors are linked to each other. And that creates a diffusion of their error terms and all your statistical inference is wrong, right? So whether it's a problem or a, or a feature, this notion that things are linked to each other and thus the thing you care about spreads through those linkages is part and parcel of the connectionist model of network. And we're going to spend most of our time, as reflecting in the rest of the field, thinking about the connectionist model of uh, networks. But I want to sensitize you to the idea that there's more to networks than just networks as pipes. There's this notion of networks as positions. And a network as a position is the idea that a role is encapsulated by a set of exchange relations. So teachers provide instructions for students. Cops provide handcuffs for robbers. Right. Stores provide goods for customers. There's this linkage of an exchange between a one person on a roll side of a roll and another person on the other side of the roll. And whatever they exchange is a linkage. And if you have enough of these patterns of exchange, you can create a position that is characteristic of a way of being in a society. And that means that really what the network is doing isn't so much spreading a bit of information, it's shaping a way that you think about and engage in the world you if you were to think of, um, uh, and I, I hesitate to use this um, uh, analogy when there's an actual linguist in the room, but if you think about the connectionist notion as uh, a network as, say, a paragraph or a story, this networks of roles is the grammar that drives the language. Right? So this is the story you learn from reading the sentence. This is the grammar that drives the sentence itself. Right? It's that kind of an idea, and hopefully that'll make sense when we get there later. On the columns, we can think about networks moving through local networks, right? Just the people you're directly connected to. My family, my friends, my coworkers, right? So these are ego networks or local networks. Um, these are incredibly useful, right? And, and the data is often easier to collect than the kind of data we're gonna spend most of our time talking about, which is what we refer to as complete networks or networks where you have some set of relations on everybody of interest to your sample. So there might be everybody in a school, everybody in a community, all nations in the world, something like that. Um, there's also now much more interest being given to uh, collections of networks, which we're going to call multiple networks. So you might have 100 different schools or 50 different villages or you know, families across 300, a sample of 300 family networks, right? So each of these networks then is collected. And you want to think of them not just as describing the patterns in one network, but you want to figure out what's common across all the networks and what creates distinction, what's within and between these different multiple networks. All right, 
So I already talked about this a bit, but the classic notion of a connectionist model of networks is that we care about how things move through the network. And so the, the fundamental idea here is the notion of something like a diffusion coefficient. And so we can think about R naught, the reproductive rate, the number that's been sort of burned into our heads over the course of the last three years. And this is a function, as you might expect, of the duration of contact, the likelihood of contact, and the duration of infectiousness. This is the equation from a network standpoint of R naught. And this little thing, connectivity, is the network. And I've given you this, many of you have seen this, this image before. But if you were to imagine a sexual network, each person that we've sampled has two sexual partners. If we want to understand where a disease might flow in this network, it's really not enough to know that each person has two partners. Instead, we want to know how those partners are connected to every, other people's partners and so forth. And so this is from Ad Health. This is an actual high school sexual network romantic network, and so this kid has two partners, but that partner has another partner, has another partner. This is the graph that your mother said that you should be afraid of, right? So everyone you've slept with has slept with someone else and slept with someone else, and what you hope is that you're down here somewhere and not up here somewhere, right? The positional idea, on the other hand, um, says that we think about networks as this pattern of exchanges. And so if I give you this network and I say that there are two people that exchange romantic love and they feed three people that fight with each other, you might think of this as your classic cartoon family network, right? And so you have parents and children, and hilarity ensues when they do whatever it is they do. What's interesting, of course, about this is that you don't need um, the labels to know what this is. And that's what the positional model does. The positional model says, if you give me a series of exchange relations, that social systems will organize those systematically. They will come to some regular reoccurrence. Right? They're not just randomly distributed. And that regular reoccurrence is the implicit social knowledge that people have about roles, and thus we'll end up creating um, sort of clusters of people that have the same thing. Please. That's that's a that's a great question. The the, the a multi the, the the glib answer is um, a two about ten years difference is really the only thing that's different. Is a, a multi layer network is a multiplex network, um, and we would have called it that ten years ago. Um, but somebody came up with the idea of a multi layer network, and multiplex networks are effectively a special case of multi. -layer. The main difference is, is that in a real multi-layer network, or in one that's, where the difference is meaningful, is that the different layers in the network, say, you know, kids and parents, um, are of a qualitatively different kind. Um, in a multiplex network, what you have are different flavors of relationships among the same set of nodes. Well, depending on if it's an intra versus intra. Right. Exactly. In theory, yes. <laughs> okay. So um, we're going to get to that in just a moment. Now, the, um, the positional network has this the, the idea, has this really this notion of identity. And this is why I think it's one of, one of the things that hasn't been done a lot with positional approaches is focusing on, on local networks. So that cell of ego network and positional tends to be pretty thin in, terms, in the kinds of work that people have done historically. And so I'm throwing this out for you to have a look at it because of some of the, my favorite work of this has been what Bria Perry and Bernice Pesco Salido have done, thinking about the patterns of relations people have across their different con social contexts. All right. Um, so there is this class. I'm going to throw a little bit of wider theory out there for you because I just can't help myself. That there's this classic structure action tension in network analysis. That part of what we care about for networks is we have these beautiful objects that we create. And they, they seem real. There's a structure there. And, and so this structuralist tendency is the sort of the structural anthropology roots of social network analysis. These strong structures usually carry with them this idea that actors follow a set of rules and they do whatever the network puts them to do. And this, is the, and this comes with this problem that says that actors are cultural dupes. And so if you have a really strong model and structure, actors don't tend to do much. They tend to just follow the rules that are given to them. On the other hand, we expect that these relationships create resources for people that they can draw on and use. And by using those resources, they can actually be effective in the world they're at. And that's a very agentic point of view. 
And so these two things are in tension with each other. So the agentic model of people doing things with resources at their own choosing and people being locked into a structure by the pattern of relations around them are kind of in fighting with each other in the theoretical sort of movements that come out of social knowledge analysis. I think this is a good tension. I think it's a generative tension. It helps us think about um, the way the world is going along. But just be aware of it as you're dealing with your, with your hypotheses and trying to understand these planes of the world you're in, that these two things can often be at tension with each other. And your job is to try to figure out what's going on in any given setting. Is an agent creating relations, or are they the result of those relations? And there's a cause or effect kind of problem here. Um, this notion of multiple levels for positional analysis, I'm going to leave aside for now and just jump on to the, uh, to the points and line sets. Any bigger, que big picture questions about, again, a lot of this should be review. Um, All right, so I'm going to now just move over to really the nuts and bolts of what network analysis is. All the rest of the theory things that we've sort of talked to up in this point, the history bits, um, you know, those are sort of that academic interest. If you really want to do this research, which is what I assume you do, which is why you're in this room, then um, you kind of need to get some data in hand and do something with it. Um, the basic data that we deal with are a joint data set of nodes and edges. And so the nodes part of the data set are your actors, your organizations, your people. These are the things that have relations. For most of us, these will be people. But they could be organizations. They could be viruses. They could be any entity that is connected to some other entity. But most of the time, we refer to people. Now, because social network analysis has been growing up across math, across computer science, physics, all kinds of different fields, the jargon in the field ends up being pretty ridiculous. So you, we hear nodes, actors, vertices, like all of these mean the same thing. Right? These are the ends of the lines. And then relations connect. And so the node part of the data set is something you've used to have been using if you're a social scientist all your life. So this is just a rectangular data frame where each row is an observation, each column is a variable or an attribute, and you can have as big a data frame as you want to describe nodes. Right? That's the standard bread and butter of every social scientist. The relationships, on the other hand, link them together. And whatever index you have connecting your, you know, identifying your nodes, a pair of those becomes an edge. Right? Now, relationships take on multiple forms. You can have the basic says two nodes are connected or not. So um, it's either present or absent, right? And so in a meeting together. And so are related would be a, a necessarily symmetric relationship. If I'm in a meeting with you, you must be in a meeting with me. Co-presence required, right? unless something weird is happening. A directed binary network says that there's a difference between what I do to you and you do to me. Right? So if I say hi to you, you might not say hi to me. Right? And so, that, so speaking to is a directed relationship. C speaks to B, B snubs C and doesn't respond. We can also value these ties, right? either by the number of times that something happens, or if you're graphically doing it, by the thickness in that set. Now, you can have multiplex ties, and this is the discussion we were having just a second ago. If you have the same set of edges, you can have many relationships layered over those edges. Right? So it's possible that we can be friends and coworkers, perhaps harder for academics if you've ever been in my department. Um, or that's a joke. I like my colleagues. I'm just trying to make sure you're still awake. Um, and so the, uh, uh, but the, uh, the multiple relations just get stacked on top of each other. Right? So you can be friends and colleagues. You can exchange advice and so forth. And in fact, this is arguably what makes social relations interesting and a little bit different than just pipes is because you can be multiple things at once. And whether these things are in conflict or not is, is kind of interesting. Um, and if you go to the levels of analysis, we already talked about this a minute ago. Ego networks are where data that you collect where you have a single individual and, you, and their respondents. Oftentimes, they're, or sorry, they're interlocutors, they're, they're contacts. Oftentimes, those contacts are reported by ego, right? So you'll survey me, and I will say, my five best friends are Joe, Mary, Jill, and Jane, and Jane. So I have five friends, two of which are named Jane. 
But notice what that is, right? That's just survey data, right? So that's data that we all know how to use. It's a single respondent and a bunch of questions, and we want to combine those questions in an interesting way. But the beauty of that data is you can collect it with a standard survey instrument, right? And so it's ego and the people they're connected to. Now, if you're really lucky, you can get that data from them, right? So I interview a person, I say, who's your friends? And then I go out and I interview those friends, and you get some, some confirmation on the information. But you can do a lot with, with, with just the things that, that the respondent says about their authors. A partial network is anything sort of bigger than just the ego network, but perhaps not the entire setting that you're interested in. So if I'm interested in all sexual networks in Chicago, right, I'm unlikely to actually survey everybody in Chicago. Right? But I might sample a few people, ask them about their partners, and then ask them about their partners, and snowball out of ways. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. You can do snowball tracing completely ad hoc, right? Just get anybody who will answer your survey. Or you can be a little more systematic, and there's um, what are known as adapted sampling routines or respondent driven sampling routines, which allow you to weight this snowballing in a particular way, and that weighting allows you to infer to the population in a nice way. And we'll hear a little bit about that. Um, which I don't know if Ashton's, I don't think Ashton's gonna talk much about respondent driven sampling. On the other hand, we have what we call complete or sociocentric or um, global networks. These are all terms for the same thing. But the idea here is that you have relations, you have a fixed set of nodes, say all kids in a classroom, and then you're interested in all possible relations among those sets of kids. So all clergy in North Carolina, all you know, Supreme Court justices in the United States. So it could be a small set, there's only 12 of them, um, but their relationships are somehow um, what Joe was of interest to. Now, oftentimes our theoretical frame isn't the same as the frame that we can collect. So for example, if I'm talking about sexual networks, um, I might have, I might have be interested in all sexual networks in Colorado Springs, and John Potter did a great job, but he didn't get them all, right? And so we know it's an incomplete data set, but we're gonna treat it as if it's a global network anyway. All right. And this is an, I'll go through that the other way. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, Another way to think about data, about network data, is, is a distinction between the number of modes of connection. And so a one-mode data set is, a, is the standard that we've been talking about thus far. And a one, in a one-mode data, data set, each person or each node in the network could connect to any other node in the network. There's no logical distinction that makes it impossible for one node to go to the next. So in theory, any kid can be a friend with any other kid in high school. Right? There's nothing that makes that impossible. In a two-mode data set, or a multi-mode data set, there's some distinction between the nodes that means that relations only happen across nodes, but never within modes, right? So you might, for example, have authors and papers. So authors are linked to papers, but papers are not linked to each other, and authors are not linked to each other, except through the fact that they shared a paper together, right? And so these kinds of people as member of groups, or words used by people, or events in the life history of people, these are two-mode networks. And the beauty of two-mode networks is they are everywhere, right? People attending a meeting, um, people answering a question on a survey, anything that you can link a person to becomes a two-mode network. And what's nice about it is that, come on in, um, uh, what's nice about it is that anything that you have, then you can turn it into this network frame. And the joke that I always make to my students is that I'm a network imperialist. Right, in the sense that I will turn everything into a network if you give me an opportunity. Um, I'm also a network empiricist, but that part sort of comes later. And so, like, literally, I can turn any problem into a network problem. And I think usually profitably, sometimes trivially, but most of the time profitably. Once you have a multi mode network, you end up with the capacity then to treat it as is. I can just analyze it as a bipartisan, in this case, which is known as a bipartite network. I have two parts. That's the by, so I have the events and the people. And if you analyze it just straight this way, it's a little weird because there are a lot of things here where ties can't exist, so a lot of the standard metrics are wrong, but people do it, and we'll, we'll talk about the right way to do it later, but just so you know, you could do it that way if you wanted. Oftentimes, people do what's called a projection, and so they would say, instead of talking about people and, and their events, let's just talk about people to people and weight their ties by the number of events they share. Or flip it around and talk about events and the number of people who co-attend those events. And this is why this is really fun, because you can do almost anything with this. And one of my favorite examples 
is in hospitals. People think of hospitals as if they're one uniform organization. You show up, you get sick, and you get to the doctor, and you're just drawn from the pool. But in fact, most hospitals have multiple practices built into them, and huge informal networks that they come out of the referrals of one patient to another. And you can map those referral networks by looking at how frequently two doctors share a patient. And when you do that, you typically find that most hospitals have two, if not three, internal communities. And those communities differ in the quality of healthcare they provide. And that sort of sucks because you don't know which draw you got when you got there, right? And so, for example, this is a paper that we did, um, a, group, a colleague of mine at uh, Weill Medical Center um, did. And we were able to show that um, readmission re rates for, for cardiac surgery varied by like two orders of magnitude over the course of whether of which of the clusters you would be in, um, you know, in, in a particular hospital within the same hospital. This is a hospital fixed effect model, right? So it's the kind of thing that really can matter and th these data are there and most people just don't even know that it's there. But you can do it with um, hospitals and sharing patients. You can do it with faculty on committees. You can do it with students in classrooms. And so anywhere you have people doing stuff, you have the implicit networks that come with the time that they're spending together. Now, a generalization of a bipartite network is this thing called a multi-layer network. And a multi-layer network says, if you have two layers, that's a bipartite network, sort of people and events. Um, excuse me. <coughs> but a multi-layer network says we have different categories of nodes. And each of those categories of nodes has some feature that creates a relationship amongst them. And there's some opportunity for relationship between them. So we can have relationships that occur in, th in, if you will, in three dimensions. And so we have a within layer tie and a between layer tie. Um, I'm going to talk more about how you construct these networks later. The beauty of the multi-layer framework is that it becomes a really nice way to simultaneously introduce all kinds of heterogeneity to your network modeling and to radically simplify the way in which those, that, those data are treated. There are some more scary chairs in the front if people want to use them, um, uh, or you can grab over in the sides. Um, I really don't bite. Um, <laughs> it's possible. All right. So, so far, I haven't talked about actual data structures, so I'll do that really quickly. Um, the traditional way of dealing with data in social network analysis has been to use this thing called an adjacency matrix, and you'll still see us talking about an adjacency matrix from time to time. No one ever really uses an adjacency matrix anymore because they're, um, they're, they're just too cumbersome. Um, but they, they are nice because as a matrix, you can do matrix algebra on them. And so we typically refer to them this way implicitly. Um, but it's good to get your head around what an adjacency matrix is. And it's a, it's a double array or a two-dimensional array with nodes down the rows and nodes, nodes across the columns. And the cell value is the relationship amongst the row and the column. So here we see the node A is linked to node B, and that's indicated by a 1. The absence of a 1 means they're not tied to each other. Right? So that's an adjacency matrix, your basic sort of standard data object that we use in network analysis. And the beauty of the matrix is it's incredibly flexible. Right? So if I want to have a directed one, I just have some of these ties above the diagonal, don't match the ties below the diagonal. If I want to have a valued one, I just replace the binary with a value. If I want to have multiple relations, I can stack this thing on top of each other. Now, when I say that we don't usually use the adjacency matrix, the reason is because most social networks are sparse. It means there's many fewer ties than there are possible ties that you could have. And it's just really inefficient to store an n by n matrix when, you, not when most of it's empty. And so if you know that the, the value of the vast majority of these things are zeros, all you need to do is record the ones, and the zeros can be implicit. And there are multiple ways to do this. The most common two ways to do it are known as an adjacency list or an arc list. The advantage of an adjacency list is really just a rectangular data frame. This is the kind of data you're used to seeing. You have each respondent down a row and their first friend, their second friend, their third friend across the columns. Right? And this is a nice, easy way to store the data. It also has an advantage if, the row, if your IDs are also your row numbers. This becomes a really efficient data structure for doing algorithms on, because you can do a walk by saying, go to the dth row, go to each row, and so forth. So there are some advantages to an adjacency list. I mean, if you ever you're writing, if you ever find yourself in the position of writing an algorithm, um, you'll find yourself using this more often than not. In practice, the kind of data that we often collect are known as arc lists or edge lists, where we just create one column for sender and one column for receiver. 
If it's an undirected network, we don't care which one you're in. We might either have them both like I do here, or you just have one of them and tell your machine that to copy it over and make it his again. Okay. Now the beauty of the uh, adjacency list and arc list format is that calculating the values is pretty easy. You, for an adjacency list, you just have a what and a how much. So if it's a friendship and how much do I like them, a parallel list. Or an arc list, it's just a new column on the edge. So A to B of value one, B to C of value two, and so forth. Right? And so this is a very efficient way to carry the data. Now, if you have a multi-relational network, you end up typically traditionally storing that in a stacked adjacency matrix. And so a stacked adjacency matrix would have, if you have two relations, you'd have two n rows and n columns. And so you'd have the first set of relations here, the second set of relations there. And it's a very easy way to store the data. And again, if you did it in the arc list format, you'd have A to B, its value, and its relation there. And so here you can see that C to B is both green and red. So it's the same relation between the same dyad. That's the idea. Now, if you have a bipartite network or a two-mode network, the really only difference from the adjacency network idea is that your adjacency matrix is no longer square. Right, and so there's, and there's no special meaning of diagonal because no, there's not necessarily a diagonal. And so you have as many columns as you have, say, classrooms, and as many rows as you have students, and then this tells you whether or not student A was in classroom five. Right? <coughs> now, if you have a multi-layer network, typically what you do is you, can, you have one adjacency matrix for each layer. That's what the big squares are. And, the adjacent, and then you may or may not have you know, whatever kind of relations characterize the relationships inside that layer. And so if it's a binary network, as I have here, it's just you know, blue or not. But it could be that this first, if, the, if, if instead of time, this were you know, work and kinship, then work might be the number of hours you spend together, and kinship might need to be binary. So these need not be the same quality within each matrix. The key is the between layer linkages. So here we have what are known as identity arcs. And so it's the case that person one, the first row of this relationship is linked to the first row of that relationship, which is linked to the first row of that one, and so forth. And this just tells you that person one is the same person in wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four, and wave five. And so here we have a temporal representation of a multi-layer network. Um, and what's nice about this is if you want to do something like a diffusion experiment and you want to see how likely it is that a, you know the dynamics of the relationship on, that you know at each wave when people were friends with each other and you want to figure out whether or not a secret could spread from one person to another over time, you can let them learn the secret in one wave and then only pass it to themselves between time and only to others within time. And so you can do these nice temporal features with these kinds of models. I'm not going to spend much time on visualization. I have a whole presentation on visualization. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So I'm going to talk about the two, the three classic kinds of visualizations. Um, and so the two basic types of visualizations. Do I have this here? Where'd it go? Here we are. Oh, why is the up? Here we are. Yeah. So we we typically have three basic kinds of network visualizations. Um, the first is a tree-based layout, and so this is what the, you would commonly see in organizational studies as an, organ, an org chart, right? If you've ever been in a university or a business, you have a CEO, you have the people that are under them. If you're at Duke, you have you know, the, the provost, about 45 layers of administration, and then faculty <laughs> down here at the bottom. Uh, and the advantage of these kinds of organizational charts in theory is that you can get some sense of who's who, right? And the beauty of, the, of any of these kinds of models is that the y-axis is meaningful, right? And so it tells you something about whatever process you're dealing with. If, like I said, if it's Duke, this is authority. If it's a disease transmission, this is your patient zero, and this is the people they ultimately infected, right? A force-based layout, there's no meaning to the x and y-axis. The only thing that matters is proximity. So two nodes are next to each other, if they have a link linking them. And in theory, if you could spread them out perfectly, the links would all be exactly the same width, right? So a, a relation of strength one would be one unit long. And so then you could figure out how close people are by how far they are on this, on this page. Now, if your, relation, if your network has an actual internal ordering, then this kind of layout sort of sucks. It does, it, you could figure it out if you had to find the root, but it's, it's a bad way to do it. And so, in, but, 
Alternatively, if your network has clusters and clumps, this kind of a of spatial layout automatically makes those clusters and clumps near each other. And you can find them and you can see them. And so that makes it nice. Whereas a tree-based layout for this is useless. Now, the third kind of, of layout is one where the coordinates are fixed by some exogenous feature, by something else that matters. And by far, the most common version of this is a map. So if I have a hospital and I want to know who that hospital shares patients with, it's nice to know that that hospital is located in Seattle and is more likely to you know, exchange patients with Spokane than it is with Boston, right? And so the fact that the hospitals are, phys are physically located in an actual geographic space, you should use that and make, and make use of it. Um, the advantage of that is that it lets you, you know, your, your reader usually knows something about Florida, something about California and so forth, and so this picture makes sense. The disadvantage, as everyone who's ever done a map will tell you, is that especially in places like the United States or Russia or China, you have big swaths of the country that are just empty, right? So this big empty space here is the Rocky Mountains. This is the farmland, right? There's just nothing there. And so that doesn't mean that there's sort of less social interaction here than there is here. It's just that there's more mountains in the way. And so you have to understand there's just a distortion to the network that's been put into place by using this map and the cost of, and we're usually willing to accept that distortion because the, what our audience learns from it is greater than the distortion that generates it. Now, if you do a classic space-based layout to this network, you get this. And if you know what you're looking for, you can see, for example, the Southern California clusters are kind of near each other. And here's you know, the Seattle cluster. And effectively, what happens is they get bent around um, the Midwest. And so that's Chicago over there in the middle. And where did Florida go? Florida's up here, I think, in, the, in this set. Florida is, is central in a lot of hospital exchange networks because of snowbirds, because people move there in the winter. Whereas they're, so they have a do, they have one doctor in Seattle, and then when they when the rain stops, they go, they go back down in the winter. So no, it's that kind of effect. Uh, I used if you're just curious, I, I've been trying to get people to do this. No one does it, um, but I'll I'll, I'll t tilt this windmill anyway. The spit statistic is um, the correlation between the screen space and the underlying social distance. I think that's a good metric for fit of a visualization. Um, I've never seen anyone but me report it, but maybe you will. So there you go. Um, the other sort of fixed coordinate that people use sometimes are circle layouts. Um, circular layouts were really popular in the 1930s when um, you had to use a ruler to do your network layout. Um, since then, there's really not a whole lot of use for it, um, but people still do it. Um, uh, I, th I think because they don't know what else to do. Um, a circular layout of an entire network is almost always useless. It is sometimes useful to, to lay out circles of parts of the network. And then you can sort of highlight the between cluster ties and sort of ignore the within cluster ties. But otherwise, don't use it. There's a, a version of a circular layout called a, um, a chlorogram or something like that. Don't use that either. Um, uh, the other thing to do is um, network visualizations, there are you know, an almost infinite number of ways that I can represent this same set of points and lines. Certainly with reflection, twisting, or whatever, right? So it's perfectly, like that does no change. But even if I just use slightly different algorithms to lay it out, um, they're all trying to do the same thing, but there's, they're all heuristic fits. There's no perfect mapping of, of a multi-dimensional object to a two-dimensional space. And so you have to make some kind of a trade-off to do it. And so what I encourage people to do is to use a trade-off that's meaningful to your readers and helps them learn something from the network, right? And so in this case, a classic spring and better or, or space-based layout is kind of a mess. But if I weight the internal ties double, the internal cluster ties double the uh, between cluster ties, the clusters pop out nicely. And since this paper was about clustering in the network, that was a nice thing to be able to tell people about, right? When you do that, it's probably a good idea to tell people that you've done it. You know, it's just, just because they might assume that there's no waiting going on here. And so that's the, a good data practice to be clear what you're doing. If you're sharing your code and such like we're all supposed to these days anyway, that shouldn't be an issue. But um, just be sure you, you're, you're clear what you're doing. But I, this is all another way to say is the other thing that always freaks people out when they first start playing with networks is that like, I'll be sitting down next to them and they'll say, well, I don't know, I can't see behind that. And I'll just grab the node and move it. And it's like you think I might have busted their eggs or something. It's like a really bad thing to do because we've all been told don't mess with your data. Mess with your data. Like go in and move things around if it makes your story clearer. That's per you have my permission to do that. Please. Um, are these lines available for download? 
Yes, they're not created right now, um, uh, but I can make them, right, I can send people an email afterwards. And if we, ha we have a Google Drive, I just don't think we advertise the Google Drive, so. Um, <laughs> Madeline, if you wanted to send the Google Drive link to people and share with folks, make it a public, I don't know if you're allowed to make that drive public or not. Yeah, I don't think I have opportunity. All right. I'll, I'll send the link out to everyone on the list after, after this presentation. All right. The other thing to do with networks is um, sometimes the best network image is not a network image. Um, right, the best network image is an abstraction from a network image. This I stole shamelessly from Peter, who's in the back, who's laughing at me. But this is what a, the co-voting network of the US Senate looks like. It's useless. Um, but if you sort the adjacency matrix properly, you can see this beautiful sort of clustering. And then the cross-group ties actually become meaningful. And you can ask questions like, who the heck is that, right? Um, and make sense about, well, there's somebody here who's doing this job. And it's, you, know, you can see him there a little bit, but it's just, it's just nicer that way. Um, the other abstraction you might be interested in is a process on the network as opposed to the network itself. So this is the geodesic distri distance distribution. So if you were to do a random walk, from uh, every different node in the network. When you go out one step, you get the degree distribution. Two steps, you get the two-step distribution and so forth. And this tells you sort of a way of thinking about how quickly what the forest of possible paths through this network looks like. And you can see that most of the paths through this network are pretty fast. Within three or four steps, you reach you know, essentially 90% of the population. But there are clearly some really peripheral nodes here that it take a long time to reach everyone else. And that's kind of an interesting feature. You know, maybe it's irrelevant for your process, but who knows. Um, similarly, if you have a, a spreading process on the network, then maybe you don't need to see the whole network. You just want to see what the spreading tree looks like. And so you can map that to it. And we just already talked about that one already. Questions or comments on that? I, I, I'm a visualization nerd, so I like to stuff a lot. Um, I, can, I can geek out over that for a lot if you want. Um, All right, so there are some basic network metrics. A lot of what network analysis is, and I, this is the joke I give people, that network analysis isn't particularly complicated. It's all sorting and counting, right? And so the vast majority of network metrics are just very smartly sorting and counting. And so if you know how to sort and you know how to count, you can do network analysis. Um, how exactly we sort and count um, kind of depends on a few things that we care about. And so we're gonna talk about some what I refer to as sort of the basic foundation network metrics. And what I, what I mean by metrics are scores you put on either the graph or the node that you're probably then going to use later to either convince someone to buy your product or to run them off, right? So that's the kind of thing that the metric is used for. And the kinds of ones we typically focus on are some volume features, some reachability or path things, this whole world of centrality, and then some kind of clustering. And, and we're not going to talk about um, uh, clustering much today. I'm just going to just briefly do it. So most of our networks are sparse. By sparse, what I mean is their density is really low. And density is the average value of the dyads in the network. So it's, you know, if it's a binary network, it's the proportion of edges that are present. And so that's traditionally what folks are used to thinking about. So if I have a density of 0.3, it means that 30% of the edges are present and 70% of them are absent. 70% of the dyads are null and 30% of the dyads are, are linked. For a valued relationship, that percentage metric doesn't make sense, but the calculation is the same. You just take the average of all the observed ties, and that gives you the average of the observed ties of 1.2 out of the set of 20 ties that could be there. Usually, we discard the diagonal when we, we, we don't care about ties to ourselves when we're talking about density. Um, that tends to be irrelevant, but um, otherwise, uh, you, know, you can if you have some kind of relationship where that's sensible. Like, you could do a hospital exchange network where you care about inter-hospital as well as intra-hospital ties, then the diagonal would make sense. Um, it ends up being the case that I think though density is the traditional measure of volume in networks, it sucks. It's an awful measure of volume in a network because networks have this nonlinear denominator. And so the case is that whenever I have, um, you know, n nodes, I have almost n squared possible ties in the network. And so the denominator of the network, of the density score, grows at the square of the size of the network, 
the numerator grows linearly. And so your density ends up being non-linearly um, uh, related to the size of the network. And no one knows what a 0. .0006 density means. Like, like, is that big or small? Well, I don't know. Do you have 1,000 nodes of your networks, or do you have 2,000 nodes of your network? And so what I typically use and recommend people to use is just average degree. And so the number at the degree of a node is the number of ties, the number of other nodes adjacent to that node is its degree. So the number of, pe number of friends I have is my friendship degree. The number of romantic partners I have is my romantic degree. If it's symmetric, then the number of ties, then my out degree, the number of ties I send, is equal to my in degree, which is the number of ties I receive. If it's not symmetric, those two, those two measures will be different. If it's a valued tie, we talk about the weight of a, of a, of a, of a node. So a node's weight would be equal to its, um, the sum of the ties across its row. So this row, node E, has an out degree of two. It's tied to two nodes, but its weight is six. That's the, those, 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 so size and average degree are really the only two numbers you need in terms of volume. In terms of um, connectivity, the sort of path metrics, I really like this to remind people that what makes network systems are the fact that edges aren't connecting just to dyads, but they're connecting one dyad and another and another and another. And it's this path feature that makes networks interesting, right, beyond just the social support idea. And so any time you can imagine sort of a wandering through this space, right, that's going to give you something potentially interesting. Graph theorists have categorized these kinds of ways of walking through a network in different ways. And so a path is a link, is a walk through a network that starts at one node and ends at another node. And when you reach your own node again, you stop. So you know you don't ever go backwards on a path. On a walk, you can do whatever you want. So I can go from A to B to C to B to C to B. I can just walk back and forth here before I go elsewhere. A cycle is a path that starts and ends on itself, and those are really interesting. It turns out that cycles mean a lot in networks. They're the foundation for lots of things that we care about, particularly clustering. Um, the, the one path that we really care about a lot, at least empirically, is the shortest path. It's called the geodesic path. So that's the shortest possible number of steps it takes for me to get from one node to the next. And so in this case, you know, it, it says I can go one, two, three steps to get to E, or I can go one, two, three, four steps to go to E. So A to E's geodesic is three. It's that shortest possible path. And it turns out there are two of them. I can go from A to F to C to E, or A to B to C to E. Both of those are length three, um, uh, but they're two different ways of doing We refer to a, 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 the, the set of all nodes in a network where it's possible to trace a path between them as a component. So a component of a network is the subset of the maximal subset of the network for which it's possible to trace a path from one node in that component to every other node component. We think of these as just connected sets, right? So if you look at the plot and you see that there's no gap between any of the nodes, that's a component, right? Whereas this is one component, that's a little component, that's a little component, that's another little component, right? And so a component is, as soon as you're sort of tracing through the network and run out of nodes to reach, you've reached the end of your component, right? If your network is connected, or directed, excuse me, then you can distinguish between strong and weak components. In practice, that's rarely relevant for most of the work we do. Um, there are a few things where it matters. Most of the time, we typically think about weak components versus not, and then the um, amount of volume between pairs when we talk about reachability. <coughs> I'm going to skip this part, other than to say that most of the time we care about this connectivity in networks, one of the things we care about is whether or not the network is, is broadly connected or star connected. <coughs> if there's a few hubs that if you remove them, disconnect the network, these are cut nodes. And those can often be really important, um, particularly in disease diffusion problems. If we're interested in stopping the spread of a disease and we know that our network has these hubs, then ideally we would find those hubs and vaccinate them. I already explained what the geodesic distance is. This is the set of shortest paths. If you've ever played the Kevin Bacon game or heard the notion of a small world, that's really all this is. So six degrees of separation. The, the geodesic distance is, um, we use it because it's easy to calculate. There's a 
brilliantly fast algorithm called breadth first search that takes you from one node to the next and it gets you the geodesics and it, and it gets you the distance anyway quickly. Um, I'm not at all convinced that most social processes happen on geodesic distances. I suspect that would be really remarkable if that were true. And so in fact, in practice, the more interesting distance is probably a random walk distance because I suspect that's more representative of what really happens in the world. Um, but it's only been recently that we can calculate random walk distance at any kind of speed, so we typically don't do it. Um, so traditionally, you're gonna say geodesic distance, and that's the, when I talk about distance, the default, if no one says otherwise, the distance they mean is geodesic distance. I'm gonna skip through some of that. So there's more of this in this uh, slide than you need. The, Distance tells you how far a node is from every other, so the number of steps it takes to get. You, you, if you really want to know how cohesive a network is, you need to know how far they are apart and how many ways they're held together. So it's both distance and redundancy. If you think about this when you're trying to drive in your commute, right? if you're stuck in traffic at some spot and everyone else is stuck on that same spot in traffic, that's usually because you're on the same shortest path together and there's no alternate route. If there were lots of alternate routes, you wouldn't all be stuck there on that one traffic got jammed together. And so redundancy is this, is this capacity to have multiple routes around the set. There's some formal measures for that. I'm gonna skip over what those formal measures are just to say that if you have multiple paths, the network is more connected than not. And again, you can look up this on the slides if you wanna get there. Um, centrality scoring is the idea that we care about nodes not just by um, sort of how close they are to another node, but whether or not they, where they fit in the overall shape of the network. And so centrality scores are a set of metrics designed to figure out if a node is on the edge of a network or the middle of the network. The problem is the meaning of edge and middle differs depending on what kind of centrality you're talking about. Um, and lest you think I'm ridiculous, um, this is all of the, this is a, a, someone else is even more ridiculous than me and they put together this map of the different kinds of centrality measures there are. There are hundreds of centrality measures. And some of people look at this and say, well, that's just ludicrous. That must mean that there's nothing to this. I actually think this is actually one of the more interesting pieces about network analysis, because what this should do, tell you is that what I'm doing when I'm calculating a metric on a network is operationalizing a social process. I'm trying to figure out what it is that creates sales or makes people sick or makes people trust somebody. And there's something about their pattern of relations that does that, that makes the network do that for them. And I map that onto a counting and sorting procedure and call it centrality, right? And so that's really what it is. And so some of these centrality measures, all of these purple ones are between the centralities, right? They are all focused on this notion that a node matters because somebody has to go through them to get to somebody else. And there's, you could do it through multiple loops, you could do it through a weighted set, you could do it through a threshold, right? Each of these has slightly different sort of elements about that separating feature of betweenness, whereas degree up here is just the number of ties you have, right? And so it says that I'm important because I have lots of friends, or I'm really sad because everybody hates me, right? That's a, that's a kind of, you know, that might be what it is, right? So, you can imagine that there are certain types, certain social situations where the kind of thing about relations are really simple to calculate. So like how much someone is disliked is probably a good indicator of their mental health. Um, and it's all you need. You don't need to know where they fit in the overall sort of hierarchy. You just need to know how many people dislike them, right? Whereas if I really care about who's spreading secrets, then I might need to know between us, right? And so these different kinds of social processes are gonna get mapped onto different features. If you need to know anything about centrality, there's sort of the big four measures. There's degree centrality, which is the number of people you're tied to, and so here we see that this node is tied to seven people, and each of them are tied to one, and uh, degree centrality has some weirdnesses that we can go over later. Um, uh, closeness centrality is the second, which just says if I have a distance matrix, I'm a, and I say how far person I is from person J, I add that up for all the entire row of the network, J is on, and that's their closeness centrality. That just tells you, on average, how many steps it takes me to reach everyone else. If I have, you know, really bad body odor, and I have really strong closeness centrality, everybody smells me, right? That's the radiation sort of model of closeness centrality. Awful analogy, but now it's stuck in your head. See how that works? Um, 
And so the notion of closeness centrality is that you just spread out through a radiation. Right? Um, but there's no real structure there. It's just pure distance. And the third one that you sort of need to know is this idea of betweenness centrality. Betweenness centrality says that a node matters because every other node has to go through it. So any path in this network has to go through A. So A can charge whatever price they want, right? So if you were the Phoenicians in you know, 500 BC, this is what you did with tin, right? You were, in, you were the tin monopolizers in the world, and that was a great position to be in. Um, but uh, you know, once you found your way around the Phoenicians, you didn't need them anymore, and you fall away. Uh, between a centrality, uh, the, I'm not going to go over some of, the, some of the features around them. The reason that, that again, you can, look, you can look up some of the details um, that we went over in, 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 the, in the earlier versions of this class, but um, I do, do want to remind you to not necessarily treat these as single indicators. That part of what makes centrality interesting and the fact that we have all these centrality scores is that you can use them in combination, right? So if I have high degree, I have lots of friends, and really low closeness, that means that none of my friends are friends with anybody else that matters, and we're off in our own little corner somewhere playing Dungeons and Dragons, and sort of we're off in the side, right? So that's a different setting than someone who has really high degree centrality and high closeness centrality, because that person reaches everyone quickly, right? So this is the way to think about these things as combinations that describe this multidimensional set. That was literally the world's fastest introduction to the big three. I forgot the fourth one. The fourth one is eigenvector centrality or power centrality. Um, this says that I'm important if I'm connected to other important people. The sociological version of this, the one that we always use, is called Bonasic power centrality. And so this is um, uh, Phil Bonasic's notion. And I like this measure because it has this little um, uh, coefficient on it, this, this beta coefficient, um, uh, which allows you to um, essentially say how much of the radius of the network you want to care about. So if the, if the beta is set to zero, it's degree centrality. If it's set to one, you're weighting everyone all the way out to the full reach of the network. Um, but you've used this measure today, because this is just um, page rank or eigenvector centrality. They're all fundamentally the same. They're saying that my centrality is a function of the people I'm tied to. So I'm important if I'm in tied to important people. Questions on centrality? Again, that was the world's fastest treatment of centrality. If all of this is brand new to you and you've never seen any of this before and this isn't review, let me know and I'm happy to point you some other features or, or don't be um, shy to ask questions. The other thing that you will typically do in a network is find groups. You find clusters of various sites and sciences. This is known as community detection. Um, I'm not gonna talk about community detection at all today other than to say it's gonna happen and we're gonna talk about it a lot tomorrow. Um, I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I kept the slide up there anyway. Um, <laughs> communities, I'm going to keep the slide now that I have it. Um, communities are finding groups that have this really special characteristic, which is that all of the volume of these sparse mat net matrices falls on the diagonal. And so we have these groups of people that are all friends with each other. And if I were really smart in how I sorted and counted, I'd be able to arrange the adjacency matrix such that there's a lot of ties on the diagonal and no ties between. That's what community, classic community detection is. How you get there is a, is a pain in the ass, but we'll, we'll talk about that. The other way to sort and count is to ask about roles. And now when we're, when we're thinking about roles, remember, we're here, we went this parent versus child, student versus teacher. We want to find groups. We don't, we don't necessarily want to find groups where all the density is on the diagonal. We want to find a particular pattern that is characteristic of the setting we're in. Right? And it might not be block diagonal. And so in this case, for example, the parents and children, we want to be able to, to give, given a set of relationships, could we induce that by finding set? And the way you do it is uh, this big sort of set, and we're going to do this in depth on Wednesday. And so we'll talk about both of these kinds of group finding things. All right, that was the world's fastest collection of um, uh, work on uh, metrics and so forth. And then I'm going to just introduce a little bit about models. If, in the next, I think I have a half hour on the schedule if folks are still with me. But we need to stand up and say hi to our friends real fast. Let's take three minutes. Stand up, turn around, you know, put your right foot in, put your right foot out, you know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> take five.
spend just a little bit of time without really going into any detail. There's more detail, again, more detail in the slides than you're going to get in my, in my presentation, just sort of reminding us what the different kinds of models are and what they might mean. Right? So the first model is usually the model of something through a network. And so the, and diffusion is the archetype here. The route from networks to health is via diffusion. Well, then we start with this notion through a network. Now, compartmental models have been most of our lives for the last three years, right? So we've seen um, various and sundry versions of the classic SI model, or the SEIR model, or the SIS model, or a compartmental model by age, right? There's thousands of these now that have been done. And these are really useful. Um, and they, have, um, they have what's under the hood is essentially inside of each of these buckets, the movement from, from S to I, is a homogeneous network. The idea is that there's just everyone has an instantaneous probability of being connected to everyone else within the same set. And because that network is so simple right, in its structure, we can actually use a single parameter to describe the movement from there. And if we need a little more complexity, we just say, all right, let's say beta i for young people, old people, middle-aged people, and bald professors. Right? So you can have as many compartments as you want for whatever setting you want, and just make it simple within, and then you only have to worry about the complexity between. And so I don't want to discount these models, because they really are very useful for some kinds of spreading, like COVID. They can be quite useful. Um, but there are times when we think that this picture of the world this kind of random network assumption doesn't match the reality. So they're, they're, that variance is so stark that it's worth actually having some element of the network itself. And so what diffusion models do is they say, let's just focus on a single parameter, but let's put that parameter. And so we have some likelihood that I transmits to J. That's what I'm calling PIJ here. And that's a parameter that sits on the network. And it's usually some function of the strength of the network tie, the amount of time people spend together, the kind of relationship it is. Is it a work relationship? Is it a family relationship or what have you? All of that can get turned into a probability. And once I know the probability, if the probability is zero or really low, the network doesn't, this diffusion never goes anywhere. If it's really high, it can go lots of places. But what's beautiful about this kind of a setting is that if you start at one place, in this case, I have the exact same node, and just change that probability, you get these wildly different spreads of the potential for the disease to move. And this kind of stochasticity is, is interesting because it's working over this kind of a clumpy structure. So it gets in, it moves, it gets stuck, it doesn't move. And when the network is, sorry, when the dynamics are really strong, there's nothing here that's all that interesting. It just goes from, you know, everyone's fine, someone coughs in a large seminar room, and everyone is sick. Well timed. That was a good. So I'll, I'll pay whoever did that later. Um, uh, and but you know there are other times when there's some more. The dynamics are really interesting. And and one of the things that you that's not evident in this slide because you can't see it very well, is that sometimes down here at the bottom, even though these look like there's nothing happening, you get rare events. And these rare events can happen that take a network that should be nothing happening, and all of a sudden the infection takes off. And understanding rare events, it, you can't do that with compartmental models, but you can do it really well with network models. And so that's the kind of thing that's worth thinking about. Now, if you want to ask yourself what kind of diffusion features matter, we're going to go over a lot of this stuff in detail on Friday when we talk about actual the, the diffusion set. Those are in this slide here, but the, uh, the main thing to keep in mind is that you have the reachability idea we talked about before. Is it possible for one person to reach the other? Are they in the same component? How far away are they? How much clustering there is and so forth? Um, and I'm just going to skip over these slides because you've seen them before. But just to point out that, again, that you end up with different shapes of networks have these, these kinds of features in common. The thing that makes a um, sexual network you know, kind of slow for spreading of a disease is it has these kind of really sparse ties, whereas drug sharing networks have these really dense clusters. And so those, that structure of that network contributes to the speed with which things move through it. And the final element here that I have on this list of these sort of five things that matter, this notion of star spreaders. And again, this is really what, it might, what I want you to think about there is in contrast to compartmental models, network models allow for node level heterogeneity. So you have this why the nodes are not substitutable necessarily. It's the case that people differ in their practices and that practical difference uh, matters with the spread of the disease. Uh, now, 
when you think then about a network model, right, for diffusion, we often think about also the network, the model of the network itself. And one of the key features for diffusion is this notion of assortative versus disassortative networks. And this is the extent to which people with the same volume interact with other people of the same volume. So if I have lots of sexual partners and my partners have lots of sexual partners, that's known as an assortative mixing situation. So people that have a small number of ties are tied to people who have a small number of ties. People that have a lot of number of ties are tied to lots of others. A disassortative means that people with high degree are connected to people with low degree. And this is a fundamentally different shape, right? You can just see it when you look at it. And it's one of the, it's one of the key um, uh, sort of parameters here that often goes, it, it's well known in the, in the sexual network, sort of HIV kind of literature, but you don't hear much about it other than this sort of informal notion of star spreaders. But it's really not the star spreader idea. It's not that some nodes have high degree. It's that those high degree nodes are uniquely connected and spread around the network in a way that links them to other people. And it's better to think of that as a disassortative setting. All right. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about networks, um, this is an old slide that Martina Morris and Jimmy, I think you were involved in this at the time, put together, um, where we were thinking about the spread of, um, uh, of a network, um, of a disease over a network. And what does the foundation of the network look like? How does that come to be? And you can imagine different types of populations, right? So populations with small numbers of, of nodes, this is a sexual network. And so no one has more, assuming that no one has more than three ties, right? And so, but all that happens over the course of this, these three different, these four different panels is that we shift the number of people who have one tie, some of them now have two. So the number that has three stays essentially the same, if I remember correctly. Um, but the number who have two goes up a little bit. And so the average degree goes from 1.68 to, what is it, my eyes are too bad to see that far these days, to 1.87. And you go from a network that has lots of little components to a network that has one giant connected component. And what this is, this is a feature known as the emergence of a giant connected component. And this is a classic feature of random graphs. There's always this threshold in terms of the average number of sexual partners or the average degree of a network that at some point along the distribution of average degree, the network goes from disconnected, 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 and it reaches this threshold, this tipping point, and radically jumps up to where everyone's connected to everyone else. This is a general feature of all networks and a feature of the volume aspect on networks. What differs from network to network is the shape of the degree distribution. So what's unique about this particular case, and as you can tell, I've cherry picked where those four slides came from, right? That when you have that really short degree distribution, as soon as you sort of use up a lot of those three degree nodes, they're gonna connect all of your other sort of two and one degree nodes, and you're gonna rapidly reach this super sharp threshold. Whereas if you have what's known as a scale-free network, where you have a few people that have hundreds and hundreds of ties, but most people have a few, that those people that have hundreds of ties can pull in lots of isolates, one at a time, a little bit at a time, and you sort of aggregate the network slowly. And so you still get a threshold, and it happens at a lower space, but it sort of it emerges much more slowly with respect to this um, average degree set. Now, why am I giving you this? I'm going into so much detail in this old case. That's because when we think about network models, the degree distribution and the assortativity versus disassortativity is a key element of the network model itself. So what kind of network is it? People will say, I have a scale-free network, or I have a small world network. That's what they mean by a network model. What they really mean is the shape of this underlying distribution that then makes it possible of this distribution, which then makes this kind of thing possible. Does that, does that make, is that clear? I don't feel like I explained it well, so I'm going over myself. Now, there's an entire separate side of networks um, and diffusion that has to do with the dynamics, with concurrency, and with the, with the spreading in time. I'm going to skip over that for now because it's a bit ridiculous to go into depth um, at this speed, except to say, and I think I can have it right here, that once you know the timing of relations, the exact same contact pattern here in red um, can lead to radically different potential spreading regimes depending entirely on the timing of relations. And so it ends up in the case of this little example, you end up with a, a difference of something like two orders of magnitude. Um, and it's just because you can't get sick from people who have sex with your partners after you've left them, right? So you have to have relationships unfolding in time. And that kind of temporal feature is really hard to see in most of the data we collect. Because most of the data we collect, we collect in coarse timings. We say, who have you slept with in the last year? 
not when did this start and when did it end, right? And so when you collect data in waves, you necessarily get very clumpy data temporally, and that clumpiness in the data is gonna make it hard to see so a lot of these kinds of nuanced um, uh, sort of features of the spread that can really make a difference in how fast disease moves through a population. If you're interested in this process, it's this whole thing called forward reachable paths, and there's a whole like piece that we've done on it, and I'm, I'm happy to go into it in depth, but I'm gonna leave it aside for now. All right. Um, the other kinds of models that we have are models of the spreading process itself. And so the process that I've been describing thus far is a classic biological disease spreading process. You have an infected person, they bump into a susceptible person, and with some probability, A passes to B. For social contagions, that's often not, a, we often use that model, but it's often not a great model. Because we suspect that people have a, a, a meaning-making process hidden in their heads that we don't have access to. It governs their likelihood of not just being susceptible, but acquiring an act of adopting whatever is moving through the network. So the adoption is And if you've ever like seen a, uh, you know, a street side, anybody from Chapel Hill here? Is the pit still active? Is, there still a, is the pit preacher still there? Anybody here? When I was in Chapel Hill, there was a guy that was every day would stand down in the pit with his Bible in one hand, and yelling at the top of his lungs that we're all going to hell in a handbasket, right? And so that kind of fire and brimstone preacher, right, is all about infected trying to go to a susceptible, but no one's adopting, right? And so, if you, so like the, 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 that's a good example of the active side of adopting, right? If you don't have someone out there who's willing to take Jesus into their life as a savior, right, if they're not gonna do that right there, they don't have that kind of adoption set, then you're, it's not gonna work. So you need to have some model for what makes people adopters. And the, Rod, the Everett Rogers sort of model of this, the original Diffusion of Innovations model, was one that said that people have different internal thresholds. And it's a price of your psychology, it varies from person to person, and whatever your adoption threshold is, it's unobservable, but we can infer it from the pattern of adoption. Um, a few others have come up with this notion. Um, uh, Damon Santola and Michael Macy, for example, of thinking that, well, what determines the adoption set is really a, a structural feature, not a psychological feature, and it has to do with, this, with the peer pressure, with the number of your peers that have already adopted. If many of your peers have adopted, you feel that pressure and you're more likely to adopt as well. And this has been sort of all categorized under this idea of complex contagion. And the notion here is that it's not enough to bump into a single person who is infected to in order for susceptible to pass over, but you have to have some large number of people who are infected to expose to you to get it. And so for social contagions, you might have this kind of complex adoption model, which requires multiple others to have the good before you're willing to adopt the good. The classic example in social contagion is cell phones, which is a little dated now for all of us, of course, but being the first person with a cell phone is pretty useless, right? If no one else has it, you know, it's kind of cool, but you know, no one really cares. Whereas now, if you don't have it, you're out of luck, right? So the value of something takes on a benefit the more other people have it, the sort of network complementarity is called. And so the way the complex contagion works is that if a pair of people have the good, we say I only adopt if at least two of my peers have the good, then if we start here, then that means that this person can't adopt because only one of their peers does, but this person has two peers that adopted, so they adopt next. Now this person would adopt, and these two can never adopt because they don't ever have the opportunity to adopt from two other peers, right? So that's the notion of complex contagion. And the way this, you can imagine thinking about how this trickles through a network and why it's harder than simple contagion, if I were to start with this connected pair, like this set of nodes for which at least two of their alters have already adopted is always gonna be limited um, by the degree of, their, of the set they're connected to and it spreads throughout the network. And what's kind of fun about this is that kind of contagion can actually lead to a very different type of pattern, right? And so this is, if you were to run a simulation over a set of one of these networks, and I think I did it over a bunch of these networks, um, what you find is um, if I seed the network with a connected pair, so it's at least possible for, the, this, for this thing to get started, um, most of the time, it never goes anywhere. And it never goes anywhere because it runs into this kind of a bottleneck. Once you get there, it can't pass that bridge. But if it does pass that bridge, almost everybody gets it. Right? So you either get no one getting the disease or, or adopting the benefit or everybody adopting the good. 
And that's kind of an interesting characteristic of social adoption that distinguishes from disease uh, adoption or disease diffusion. And it's conditional on some other sort of features of the network. Now, it turns out that there's lots of other features other than this complex contagion adoption model that govern the likelihood that an individual will adopt an idea or a belief or a practice that's different than the way that disease moves through networks. This falls under a rubric we call um, a peer influence dynamics. And Craig Rawlings um, uh, is going to be talking a lot about that um, uh, later in the week. He's going to do a nice session on that. As well as, and he will talk about the substantive feature of this and when it happens and why. And um, uh, we'll also be talking about how you model it statistically using the stochastic, stochastic actor-oriented models, or SOAMs. So the other use of the word model in networks has to do with statistical model. And so the statistical model for networks um, are fundamentally random graph models. And so there's this whole theory of networks um, uh, in, in uh, mathematics known as random graph theory. And random graph theory um, assumes essentially that you have a, 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 an adjacency matrix where you flip coins, right? But you don't necessarily flip them just at random. If you flip them just at random, you have this. But I can flip them in a special way, right, with a little more bias on some edges than the other. And that gives you a whole family of different possible network models. And I will go over this in depth on Thursday. All right. I want to end t today, my bit today, before I turn it over to um, uh, Leanne and Gabe, uh, just some thoughts about things that I still think are interesting problems that we might think about doing in the future, um, sort of open problems in networks. These problems, um, if I'm honest, I sort of hope you guys do, because I'm going to quit this job eventually. Um, <laughs> some days it feels sooner than other than later. Um, uh, but I, I just want to put out these ideas, and this is like my completely idiosyncratic sort of notion of what I think is useful um, uh, to be focusing on over the next few years. Um, some of these problems have been more or less solved, most of them less solved. Um, but again, I think there are some interesting questions here that you might be interested in playing with. The first is this idea of large scale social diffusion. Um, I think that our models for network diffusion are still fundamentally um, pretty limited to. Um, this kind of one wave contagion piece. And the, the characteristic of these one wave contagion models is a single hump and a single disease. And what's crazy, of course, is that we've all been through a disease process for the last three years that looks nothing like that. Now, I can get this kind of curve if I add some funky feedback features or you know, deliberately um, distort the model to fit the data, right? But to, from first principles, get this kind of curve is actually pretty difficult. Um, the best way you can do it is to involve some kind of a social feedback process where your agents are looking around and they're not the dupes of the situation around them where they just happen to bump into a disease and get sick, but they look around and they see some sick people and they walk to the other side of the room, right? And that kind of dynamic feedback where people are in real time adjusting their practices to the spread of a disease really thwarts our compartmental models in a way that we're not very good at doing right now. And so I think thinking about networks and the ways in which we have competing diffusion processes, diffusion of information while we have simultaneous diffusion of disease, for example, is a great way of thinking about how these processes would simultaneously reinform each other. And I think building, again, from first principles, a way to do that would really be interesting and I think would be really valuable. Um, I think the other thing that we can do is think about missing data. This is a problem that I've spent a lot more time thinking of than I care with. And it turns out, as you're going to hear um, tomorrow when I give this part of the talk, that it's a really hard problem. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's one of these problems that has a really elegant statistical solution that doesn't work near as well in practice as we think it should. Um, so there you go. I think there's a, a good moment for econometricians and statisticians and social theorists to think together in ways that they haven't thus far, which is that we have now statistical models for causal identification that are really strict and really powerful, um, but also really sociologically naive. Um, the thing that sort of makes social life interesting to many of us in the social theory world is that things are what we call overdetermined and reinvested. And so the idea that there is a, a single cause that you can uniquely identify for making something happen is just never true. Right? If you've ever done an interview with somebody where you ask them why they did it, and you ask them that question twice, and you get two different answers, you know that they, in fact, 
don't know what caused it, um, and they probably are unaware of what caused it. And so the notion of what's actually causing something in a medical RCT sense versus the sort of in, embodied action that people engage in to motivate their behaviors and create, a, create meaning in the world that they live in, I think that those two things are far from each other. And the way I characterize this problem is that we have this notion of re reciprocal causation, um, uh, there where people are mutually causing each other and their, be or, or their behaviors are mutually causing their interactions, but we treat that as if it's a two separate features that are occurring sort of distinct from each other and that are, are in fact separable. And I think that we need methods that are more akin to this kind of truly joint causal feature as opposed to separable unique cause features. And I don't know how to do that. I don't know if it's possible to do it from an actual estimation standpoint, um, but I think it's important to think through substantively. I think that we have underused roles, and so you're gonna hear me talking about roles a lot in this talk because this is the advanced version of this class and I want you guys to go out and do this work. So you're gonna get a lot of this to this, this week. Um, but it's really, I think, an interesting way to think about the world around us. We, none of us are unidimensional, right? None of us have, have a single relationship with anybody. Many of you in here are former students of mine, but you're also colleagues and collaborators, right? We've eaten dinner together and we've um, you know, shared offices. So there's all these other sort of layers of meaning that go on to everything. And that's true for every relationship anyone's ever been in. And I think that we now have some formal tools for doing this, um, but I think the substantive tools for, for doing it um, kind of died in the, with structural anthropology. We have like the real theory behind this has gotten, there's a, there's a sort of one branch of it that's gotten really technical called generalized block modeling, which is kind of cool mathematically. It has all these different types of equivalencies that you can play with. Um, but thinking about it in terms of the rich sort of notion of what a role is and what obligations and meanings mean for, for actors, that hasn't, been, that hasn't been explained much. And I think in the health world in particular, there's a lot of room for this. So what does it really mean to be a patient or to trust your physician? And is, and are physicians substitutable in trust? Or does it require a certain kind of relationship that has to be built up? Like, can you do drive-by healthcare and actually have trust in an institution? Or does it have to be trust in a person? And that's just the simplest possible version of where this happens. And I think because health is so fraught with people's notions of life and death and wellness, that it has a lot of meaning sort of naturally coming out of the gate that we're leaving on the table. And I think it would be really fun to, to think and exploit that. Um, I think that there's something about a network life history um, uh, that's worth thinking about. And so we should be able to um, think about relationships unfolding over a life course and so that we have you know, there's a reason that high school movies are so important in sort of like the American culture. It's because like that moment in your life course is the first time your parents let you out of their sight and you get to sneak a kiss with someone under the bleachers or whatever. And it's like this kind of secret and sort of developmental thing combined with the fact that your brains are finally actually rewiring, right? So there's all kinds of intersections here that make that moment in your life so much more important than it ever should be, right? And yet, it, it has this, this, this play for how we sort of think about our life course. And I think that has to be true for romantic relationships, it has to be true for work relationships. There's a reason that you know, full professors are grouchy at faculty meetings, they haven't just been around you people too long, right? Um, and so assistant professors are all sort of you know, shiny-eyed and ready to go. You can have it, right? So this kind of notion of a life course of relations is something that we want to play with, and I think that we can build it into our models as well. All of this is by way of saying that in the context of social networks and health, that the, the relational dynamics as they actually unfold in social settings should lead to health behavior and network mechanisms, right? Not just network methods that correlate with the, network, with the health outcome, but with thinking about what it is that actors are doing and settings are enabling to create more or less health in a setting. And I think that if we, if we as health theorists could explicate what these kinds of mechanisms are, we'd do a lot better at um, uh, you know, sort of getting this sort of model out of the set. And so this brings me to my third point, which is what do you do to get some of these pieces done? I would love to see a return to community studies. So in the 40s and 50s, it was the sort of golden age of network community studies um, where people would get whole hosts of graduate students and teams, they'd go to a community, They'd interview people, they'd take jobs in the community, they'd live there for a, few, for a few years even, in the case of one set of studies, and they would get to know the setting and build these big multi-relational settings. Now, I don't know if that's, 
like it's certainly not feasible in the kind of academic life course that most of us live in. But thinking about social setting as, it, as a full ensemble of community relations is worth doing. And it might be that that community becomes a hospital. It might be one nursing home. It might be one school that you actually integrate the, the students and the faculty and the staff and everyone together. Um, but by getting into that whole setting, you sort of sidestep this notion that we have a single X and a single Y, but instead we have a constellation of events that co-constitute each other and create the potential for healthy outcomes. And community studies did that really well. A lot of good qualitative work does this. Now there's a lot of bad qualitative work, but really good qualitative work takes takes seriously the, 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 both the meanings that people give for the work they do and this, the context within which those meanings are generated. And if we do that well, um, I think we, that's what, in many ways the most powerful work we can do. Now, perhaps the easiest way to do this is to take advantage of what the modern world has that the old community studies never had, which is the electronic traces we all leave around. So digital traces and digital sort of ethnography is something that we should be thinking seriously about. So there are lots of ways to do this now that are much less um, you know, intrusive than they used to be. So I mean, the one problem with the old community study idea is you had some foreigner sitting in on every you know, meeting. They were really an outsider looking in. The beauty of me just putting an app on your phone is that you don't even know I'm there, right? And so Google probably does this to us already, right? So you can, so you can see what's there. So there's got to be an ethical way for us to you know, put a trace on people. But finding a way to take the digital traces that we all leave of our lives, and in many ways very deeply, um, and finding a way to link those together with actual behavior to do that. Now there's a lot you can do, I think, in some settings with electronic health records for this. And so um, in a community like Durham, like, Duke Hospitals has a monopoly on everybody in this county who goes to a doctor. So if you go to a doctor in Durham County, odds are really good you're in the Duke Electronic Medical Records data set. And so we have, in many cases, the life course of each person, their kids, right? And you know, at least until those kids graduate, all the way through this set. So you have lots of opportunities to link people together in a full setting. And if you can combine that with the contextual data we have, about the city and about the opportunities and employment and so forth, you can really get a lot out of that. So there might be opportunities for people like me who would rather be in front of a computer than in a meeting or actually trying to do an ethnography um, to do this kind of work um, without having to actually go out and talk to a real human being. Um, and that's what I'm meant by the electronic traces at the end. So I'm going to end there. And I'm going to really first um, encourage you to have fun this week. I'm so glad you're all here. It's really great to see everybody. Um, we're going to switch over now. We'll take a quick break. Um, and I think uh, next, is it Gabe or Leanne? Leanne's next. We're going to do next is a little bit of review of how to use R. Um, so if that's uh, uh, for those of you that you know, haven't looked at R since last time you were in this meeting or haven't looked at R at all, um, uh, that's a chance for us to get a, just to be on the same language because the rest of this week you're going to see a lot of um, R, you know, R scripts that are going to be shown and so forth. And just to give you a sense of what's going on with that. And then we'll end today with um, Gabe presenting a, a new set of software that we're, um, uh, Gabe and Tom, is Kieran here? Is that, is, is there, um, and it's also going to be helpful presenting that. So questions, comments, thoughts before we set loose from this first session. Awesome. All right, thank you.
Again, I'm one of the RAs for this workshop. Um, there's four of us walking around. Um, Gabe in the back is going to present next. Tom also in the back, and Madeline, who you can also thank for organizing all the food for this week, um, <laughs> and basically doing all the organization with Jim. But uh, anyway, so I'm uh, one of Jim's students, I guess maybe former students now. I just finished my PhD in the sociology department here. <laughs> um, and so we're gonna do a really like quick and compressed version, if you've been here before or seen the online videos of Maria Cristina's training on how to basic some basic R stuff and coding, and then how to kind of get your raw data or survey data into the format usable for network objects or graph objects in R. So I don't think this is gonna take the whole time, um, and it's gonna be really quick, so it's either gonna be boring for those of you who've done it before, or maybe overwhelming if you've never done it before. Um, so everyone's gonna be a little bit confused, but either way. <laughs> um, so first thing I wanna mention, if uh, you don't use R, if you haven't, if you're new to it, or if you only use it for network stuff, just some clarity when we're talking about these terms in coding. Um, there are two programs, essentially, that you're kind of using. Um, there's R, which is the actual statistical programming language, and then RStudio, which is the IDE that you're actually using to do all your programming and coding. Um, and the way, best way I can think about it is that R is the engine under the hood doing all the work and all the statistical mumbo jumbo, and then the RStudio is the environment that lets us kind of see what we're doing, uh, keep our script files all saved and organized, um, and just make the user face a lot more um, friendly um, and easier to use. Um, so, again, if you're new to R, just really quickly, I wanna kind of tell you what the RStudio format looks like. When you open it, this is what it looks like as a blank screen. Um, your top left corner is what we call your source. So if you are saving files or writing code that you wanna save for later, um, which you should, that's where you would write all your source code and you would save those either as script files, which is like your notepad on your desktop computer, um, or text edit if you have a Mac. And if you have a markdown file where you're saving, you're doing presentations, so all of this I made in markdown, that will all be in your source code here. When you run something from your source code, gets passed through to the console, which is down here. The console is actually where R's engine is that's doing all the work. So you'll see a bunch of lines happening here when you're running computer. Um, error messages will pop up here as well. You can run stuff directly in the console, but you will not be saved. It's you're doing like quick calculations is usually what I use it for, um, but nothing that I want to refer back to later because it will get lost. Over in the top right is your environment and history. So most of the time, this is where you'll be looking for what objects you have in R. Um, again, if you're new to R, it's an object-oriented language, so everything you do gets saved as an object, and you can see what you saved in here. So your data files, um, if you do some calculations and you want to save it, if you have any functions you've created or have saved from different Stack Overflow sources, those will all end up in the environment panel here. And there's a little history tab button that can show you stuff you've run. If you happen to run something in the console, and you forgot to put it in the source over there. And finally, the last pane over here um, has your files, so what your current working directory is. That's whatever folder you're saving all of your R files to, whatever you're pulling out from, if you're keeping your data there. Um, it also has where your plots will show up if you're making those, and so where all your packages are, and your help um, tab as well if you need to to reference back what certain functions need to work properly. Um, and feel free to stop with questions if you have any. Okay, so another last kind of brief, very intro to our thing. Again, Maria Christina has a much more in-depth um, version of this online on our training website, uh, videos, court, and code, and everything. Um, a couple of operators you should be aware of using an R. So the first one is this C with the parentheses, which is a function that creates a vector, so just a little store, store some information there. You'll see that in some code I put up um, later. Uh, so we use that sometimes to create an object of either kind of strings or numbers, um, anything that we want to store as a group. The little arrow operator, so if it's a bit small, um, is how we assign uh, uh, whatever we're doing in R to an object. So when you want something to be saved, either a data set um, or a function or some calculation you're doing, you'll use the arrow function, you'll give it a name, put the arrow, and then whatever code you're writing on the right-hand side, um, and that'll make it so that whatever you run saves into R. 
you can see that in an example here. So if we're using this kind of vector function up here, we create this vector of numbers. The arrow assigns it to this term, my numbers, and it gets saved in our environment. Um, one thing to note is that these objects are case sensitive and you can't have spaces in between them. So just be careful when you're naming things um, not to make them too crazy long, but also something that you will actually remember um, and not just the same word over and over again like I've done sometimes and then get really mad at myself for. Um, the last one is a pipe, which I think there's a few ways people do it now. This is the one that I learned and I'm the most familiar with. Um, it's an operator that basically in the R language tells you and then so instead of writing a bunch of individual lines of code and reassigning it to a bunch of objects, the pipe operator lets you write a line of code and then do something else. Um, and when we get more into the creating network objects, I'll show you what that looks like. But the and then part um, is the useful way to kind of remember what it does. And these will all be posted online too, as well as the actual markdown file I used to create it with all the code. Okay, so the most, I think the fastest kind of overview of what R does and the rest of this presentation, um, I'm gonna kind of show you how to get from your survey data or whatever you have into a graph or network object that would set you up for the rest of kind of analysis we do in this class with calculating different measures that Jim mentioned in his previous presentation. So the most common packages in network analysis are StatNet and iGraph. Um, they're both really powerful and really fun, however, they are also incompatible because that's what R is like. Um, and <laughs> if you wanna use both, which we all do often, um, there is another package that someone very kindly created um, that I'll show you called Intergraph. Um, so if you create your, uh, your network object in one, you can easily transfer it to a different one um, and it makes it slightly less painful to go back and forth between the two. Um, because of Maria Cristina's tutorial, she used StatNet. I'm gonna use iGraph just so both are like relevant, are up there online once this is over and also because I pretty much exclusively use iGraph so this is also a selfish choice. Um, but the cleaning data, the setting it up is essentially the exact same for StatNet and iGraph. It's just once you get to the, using those packages, that's where it changes a little bit. Um, some useful packages, ones that I will be using here, um, not an exhaustive list, but just, um, ones that I use pretty much every day are, is the Tidyverse, which is a collection of packages. If you're aware, it's really popular now in R. Um, it makes cleaning and manipulating data a lot easier. It takes a lot of code from SQL, um, or the style of code from SQL, uh, and it's used, it may just makes the whole thing process much easier than doing it in base R code. Um, ggplot2 for creating visualizations. Uh, if you're doing kind of like basic plots of the data you have just to check on it, that's usually what I use. And then of course iGraph and StatNet that we have. iGraph to create your networks and calculate some basic measures. StatNet are the collection of packages where you can actually do the statistical analysis of the networks. And then Intergraph to go between the two. I would highly recommend not having StatNet and iGraph loaded at the same time on a package, for the packages in R, because they have the exact same name for some functions and it's gonna cause you some problems. Um, so just make sure if you're using one not to have the other in there and then unload it. Um, when you're switching back and forth. If that doesn't, if you have no idea what that means, we can help you with that. Um, we're available throughout the week basically if you want, need some extra coding help um, or have questions about anything that's going on this week. Okay, so to create a uh, network object, the first thing we need are kind of two files. We need our node file, which is a data frame of all the individuals or organizations depending on what your level of analysis is in the data set. And then the second file is your relationship structure. And the relationship structure file can come in a number of different ways. It's just depending on your own personal preference or the data set you have. The most common ones we see are the adjacency matrix and edge list or arc list that Jim showed you earlier, and I'll show you some examples. And then if you have two mode network data, so people as a part of organizations um, or something that has multiple levels, we would have a bipartite or two mode matrix. So we take our, usually we take our original data set, the raw format, and we create these two types of files to combine together in order to create our network object. So the first one is just an example of what the JCC matrix looks like, which you saw from Jim, but this kind of shows you some really simple code to make your own to play with as you're learning more of these methods. Um, so on the, uh, in the rows is everyone's individual name that's here, and on the columns, again, is everyone's name repeated. 
This is a binary network, so the zeros mean there's no tie between these people. The one means there is ties. There is a tie. Um, this is one of the simplest types of matrices. As Jim mentioned, there are more complicated ones. If you have negative ties, like kids bullying each other, you might see a negative one in there. Or if the ties are weighted, you would see different, just not just ones and zeros, but different numbers on there as well. An edge list is instead of having everyone in the rows and columns, um, you have each individual person has their own row, just like you would a regular data frame. Um, but instead, the identifying kind of variables are the first two columns. So you have person one here, um, and then nominating to whatever person is also in the data. So if you have kind of multi-wave data as well, so over, over time, each person might have also multiple rows. If they're connected to multiple people, they'll have multiple rows. Um, it basically transforms it from like a big two by two or however many by however many to just a long form data format. And the rest of the code in this presentation will show you how to get there. I think the edge list is one of the more popular ones to use um, when creating these objects in iGraph. And then finally, just an example of a bipartite matrix where we have all of our names here individually in the rows and then all of our affiliations in the column and we can use that to create a network where we are connected to each other even if we're not directly nominating each other like we would in most networks or in some networks. So the first, the first three examples were ways that you can have your relationship structure file. This one is what you would definitely need to have which is your node list file or the individual attributes for every person in your network. So here I've used all of our names. Uh, we might give ourselves ID numbers in addition to having our names in there. And then some kind of individual attribute information about us. Uh, so we can combine those with the relationship structure files and have information about the individuals as well as the connections between each other. Everyone with me so far? Okay. <laughs> okay, so this, uh, the rest of us are gonna go through kind of the process of how we get to the network structure. This is it highly adapted from, if not directly copied from, Maria Christina's work because she's who I learned from uh, when I was doing, starting off doing these network procedures. So the first thing we're gonna do is look at the raw data we have, the survey data. The next we're gonna do is make a plan, not go straight into coding because that will always lead to more errors. And then we're gonna work on cleaning our data, getting it to a graph object, and then we're gonna double check that what we made is actually what we wanted. So in the inspection, evaluation of our data, the first things you wanna make sure you have are whatever pieces of the data you need for the network object. So what are the variables in your data set that are gonna be attributed to the nodes, so the individual people or the organizations, and what are the pieces that are gonna be attached to the edges, so the edge attributes. And I think this is where some people get a bit confused um, when I've taught this before, is that the edge attribute or kind of variables belonging to the edges has to be some kind of variable related to the tie itself. So how often do people interact um, to the weight of the edge uh, or, yeah, weight of the edge, whereas the node um, characteristics are specific to the individual. So it's individual versus the two ties together. Um, and then once we know what we need, we have to go through the issues. So obviously you wanna clean all your data before you go to the network side, otherwise you're just gonna to have to redo everything. Um, so the issues you might have to deal with um, as they're at the observation level, whether or not there's missing data or there's stuff you need to recode itself, um, or if it just looks kind of wonky, um, nonsensical or missing values, making sure you recode all your nine nines to missing um, or getting rid of missing if you don't need those. And at the structural level, um, making sure that all the columns you had are what you actually need, especially if you're getting data from things like Qualtrics that add extra uh, columns or rows in there that are not really necessary, but just are part of the structure of the, of the system itself. Um, and just making sure, again, everything is in the right format that you need it to be. So basically, all to say is to just kind of look at your data physically in the spreadsheet format before you do anything and make sure it looks how you expect it to look. What we want at the end of this is a, sort of a spreadsheet that has um, all of our individuals, who they're tied to in some format so we can manipulate it later. Um, again, don't start manipulating or doing anything before you figure out what you need to do. 
um, get a good sense of what you have to first. Something that I do um, that helps me a lot if you're a visual person, which if you do enough network stuff, you will become a visual person, is to actually draw out what you need. Um, and it's easy to go back to to be able to figure out what you need to do later. Um, and it makes you have a lot fewer errors as you're uh, doing all this out. Okay, so once you've expected your data, then you go to the making a plan stage. And again, this is where we're not coding yet. We're still just writing everything out, figuring out what we need to do um, before we actually jump into the data set itself. So coming up with your series of tasks you need to clean the data, but also to get it in the structure you need it for the network. Um, again, removing missing values or imputing, that's your decision based on your data, you know it best. Um, and then how to restructure the data set. So if you want to use an adjacency matrix versus an edge list, those are all decisions you have to make um, that you need to decide what's best for your data set because you know your data set best. Okay. So once you have your plan laid out, then we're gonna actually go in and cleaning the data, structuring it, and creating our network or graph object um, using our network analysis package. In this case, we're gonna use iGraph um, to create our graph object. And then finally, we're gonna go back, check your work, make sure it looks like what you think it looks like, either by doing some basic descriptives to make sure that it makes sense. Um, usually as soon as I create a network object, I plot it straight away to see if anything looks crazy. Um, or if it doesn't, isn't behaving the way I think it should be behaving. Okay, so I'm gonna go through an example. I'm not gonna do hands-on coding with this. I'm just gonna show you code and sometimes some results um, since we've done most of this before in previous years. Uh, and again, you can run this all yourself online or take code from here afterwards. So the first thing to do is loading packages. You know you're gonna need, so loading my cleaning packages and my iGraph package and um, we're going to use a kind of fake ad health data set, so survey data set. If you're unfamiliar with ad health, it's a national longitudinal study of adolescent health where kids were surveyed about their health behaviors in addition to asking who their closest five male and closest five female friends are. So it gives us quite a big network to work with, at least for them. So what we want to do first is understand the structure of our data, and there's a few commands that can help us with that. Um, the first is to make sure that it's actually imported. When you've imported it here, if it's been as a CSV or a SAS file or as an Excel file, that it actually has saved to your R environment as a data file or data set. It's what we usually need to work with these um, objects. And so the class function can tell you what kind of class that object is. In this case, it would show us it's a data set. Um, you can also specify for different variables within your data set to see what those class options are. Um, if those are, if changing those is meaningful to you. Um, we can also see what all of the names are in the variables or the column names to get a sense of what we have. Usually we don't need all the columns that we actually do have, so it's helpful to get rid of those. Um, for this purpose of this kind of tutorial, we're gonna look at these um, variables. So all we really need is our ID for the ego, all of the friends nominations they did, and then just some basic um, node attributes, so their sex, their grade, and what school they are in. And we're just gonna subset all of this for the purpose of this exercise to school seven out of like, I think there are 130 or so. So a couple of other um, functions that are useful as well is uh, Glimpse, which is part of the tidyverse that gives you a list of all of the variables you have, but also tells you what class they are stored in. So if you have some numbers that should be characters or something along those lines, you can check that through there and it'll list them all in a pretty neat way. Um, again, making sure that you're, you know your data best so going in conjunction with your codebook or survey, looking for red flags to, to point out so you're missing or your 999 variables um, and either removing those or um, recoding them so that you know what those are. Um, a couple of other useful functions are head and tail, which basically shows you the first six rows of observations and the last six rows of observations. You can also add a number as an argument and it'll give you as many as you've asked for essentially. Um, and then the summary function, if you do it on the entire data set, will basically give you your five number summary for every single variable you have in the data set. Um, where it makes sense, if you have a factor or character variable, it'll give you a proportion or the number at each level that you have. Okay, and the next is um, probably a review for everyone, basically your data, basic data exploration process when you're looking at your data, this is not kind of restricted to networks, this is just how we all 
do analysis, hopefully. Um, so making tables for your variables of interest so you know which ones to keep. So usually we'll do a couple of cross tabulations or just simple like counting of who's in what. So just here, I created a table of just how many kids are in each uh, grade. This one I think is recoded differently, but um, just to get a sense of who's there so you know if anything's super wonky. So some basic tables and then some cross tabs, especially if you're using, um, if you know you're gonna use certain, certain types of variables and wanna know, um, get some basic ideas and if they might be related or not. Um, again, this is basic data kind of management and exploration before we're getting into the nitty gritty side of the data, of the network side. Um, and lastly, again, not doing visualizations, not just for the networks, but then also just doing basic kind of uh, data exploration visualizations is really helpful. Um, to understand what's going on, especially the network side. So this variable specifically, I just made a bar plot of everyone's total nominations for friendships and at health, um, just to see what the distribution of that is like that might be helpful for me later, depending on my research question. Okay, so we've looked at our data, we kind of have an idea of what the structure is, um, and so now we need to deal with it. So again, we're not gonna get jump into coding straight away. We're just gonna kind of make in a plan of what we're going to do. Um, again, I'm gonna do an edge list for this example. You could do an adjacency matrix if you wanted to. Um, I find edge lists easier to work with at least for this type of friendship nomination data. Um, so constructing an edge list takes a few steps. First, we have to, we only wanna look at school seven for this. So we have to filter out observations so that we only have people who are in this specific school. Um, we're moving our nominations from Y to long format. So if you think of a survey where people are nominating each other, usually for every person you'll have like friend one, friend two, friend three. That, so we want to make sure that each person and their alter has a, their own row for each other. Um, so that's the way that iGraph understands edgeless to be able to make the graph object. And then either removing or recoding, depending on your, how you're handling missing, missing data, your NAs and your 999 values. So that was our plan for our edge list. And our plan for our node list is again to also filter the original data sets so we only have school seven. You really need to make sure that you have matching edge lists and nodes list, node lists, otherwise you'll get a lot of errors. Um, usually if it can't, if it says it doesn't exist, so you have extra vertices or something, that's it's usually a filtering problem in this way. And then for the node list, you wanna select the columns or individual node attributes you wanna keep for your analysis if they're relevant. Okay, so constructing our edge list. The first thing I'm gonna do is create a new little object that's just at Health School 7. Um, something I also should be better at than we should all do is making sure you don't rewrite over your object names because then you just end up having to rerun the entire code all over again. And as much as I say to do that, I also don't listen to my own advice most of the time and then I regret it. So creating a new object just with School 7. The filter function is part of the tidyverse uh, range of packages. Um, and again, I think that's based off of SQL code. Uh, first argument is just the name of your data set, whatever you named it, and you want the, whatever that, the variable for the school is to equal seven. And then I just wanted to check to make sure that it looks like the most of them are seven, so I called head the first few rows um, of my at health school seven, the new object, and it looks like all of them are there. Um, it's definitely cut off, but just to see what it looks like. And then step two, um, I want to move from Y to long format. So this is where those pipes come in because I'm doing a couple of steps each time. This is not necessarily like the best or fastest way to do it, but this is the way I learned. So um, as with everything with coding, it's either who taught you first or which Stack Overflow page you landed on. Um, and so this is what I've been doing for as long as I've been working with networks. So the first function select is also from the tidyverse package. What I'm doing there is because this is an edge list, I only, and I don't have any um, edge characteristics. I just want the IDs of the individual person and then who they nominate. So what I've done here is I've called the school seven, the ID variable, and then all their male friend nominations and all their female friend nominations. And then with the pipe, if it longer is also in dplyr or in uh, the tidyverse, that'll shift your white uh, data set to long. Um, I'm not. I don't want it to do that to my ID column. So when, when I put the calls argument, I put negative ID. So I want it to shift everything except my ID column. Um, then it'll shift it to long. Uh, and then I'm using select again as sort of a cleanup, where I want 
to make sure my ID number is first, and then the value uh, creation with the pivot long function um, is where the new, all the friend IDs end up once you run this function. And I'm just gonna change that to alter, just for uh, my own sake, since I know what that means. Um, and lastly, I uh, want to make sure if you have any 999s or NAs, they'll still show up in the edge list. It'll just add, be adding more rows with your kind of ECOS ID and just NA or 99. And so I want to get rid of those. So I'm filtering out all of the alters that are equal to those 99s. And then I'm dropping any NA values from this edge list. And so then when I save that to the edge list object and run this kind of head um, on my object again, you'll see I just have my edge list, which is just two variables, all of my egos, and then who they nominated. So this person, node one, will have as many rows as people they have nominated in the network. Okay, so now you have your basic note, your edge list. Uh, usually it's not that clean, it probably ran into seven errors making that, um, and you'll kind of go back and forth constantly. Now I wanna construct my node list to make sure it matches. So I'm gonna filter out my add health um, original data set again, make sure that I only keep people in school seven, and then I'm gonna only select the variables that I know I wanna use in this analysis or that I wanna have in my actual network object, so I'm keeping their ID numbers to make sure it matches the edge list, um, their sex, grade, and whatever race they have identified as. And then just checking again that it's done what I want it to do, um, having a smaller little node list that makes sure so that it matches my edge list. Okay, so once I have those node lists and edge lists, I can make my network or my graph object in this case. Um, when using iGraph, we usually refer to them as graph objects. If we're using StatNet or the network pass it package, they're usually referred to as network objects. They're really interchangeable, but it's just kind of how people talk about them. Um, so I'm gonna create a new object, which is my ad health graph. I'm gonna use the graph from data frame function in iGraph, the first argument labeled D is your edge list. The second argument labeled vertices are your nodes. And then depending on your data set, you can say whether it's directed true or not. This is a friendship data set, so they are directed. So I've added directed equals true. I believe the default is false. So if you know that they're directed has meaning, make sure you add that in there. Um, and then I just ran the object just to make sure it looks like what I thought. So if you just run an iGraph object with nothing else, it'll show you this kind of summary of some of the connections um, and the attribute names so you know it's worked. Okay, so I have my iGraph object now and the first thing I wanna do is plot it to see what happened. Um, so the plot function, if you just plot the actual iGraph object, it'll spit out iGraph's kind of standard way of plotting graphs which is usually really ugly and turns into this hairball um, and it's not useful but at least it looks something like what we think it should look like. Um, I prefer personally to use ggGraph, if anyone's used it before, um, for plotting the graphs. It has similar syntax and kind of just way of thinking as ggplot2. I find it a little more flexible um, and generally prettier, which is what we care about. So um, when I'm making the plots, I'm gonna show the code first, then the plots, because it, there was just too much to put in there. Um, it does require a little bit more code than the native iGraph plotting. Uh, sequence does. Um, so I'm just loading up a couple of packages you need. Uh, for ggGraph, you also need a package called tidygraph, which creates, changes your graph object into kind of a little, um, into a structure that uh, ggGraph can use. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking my um, ad health graph, passing it through this tipple graph argument, which is from the tidygraph package, um, creating a layout. There's a ton of layouts. I think Jim showed you some of them. Um, in iGraph and ggGraph. One of the most common ones is um, FR. The other one's KK or stress. There's some auto ones it does. Um, and I've taught this before. Most of the time I'll just tell students to like, just look, find the list of everyone and just try to break something. That's usually how I learn, um, by trying to break my code um, or see what works out best. So once I've created the layout, then I'm just gonna pass it through the ggGraph argument. Um, and then what's different about the ggGraph package versus just the iGraph package is it works in layers just like ggplot2. So you have to add a layer for your edges, which is just geomatch link, and then add a layer for your nodes um, and a couple of arguments in there to color them so you can see them better. Uh, and then 
this, the ggGraph um, authors created their own theme, so it looks um, like a white background. You don't have the automatic x and y axes that you might when you're doing a ggGraph, a ggplot graph. So this is what it looks like with that code. Um, still kind of hairball-y, but better than the iGraph code by itself. Um, we can also see that there are some isolates in this network that I didn't get rid of that might be useful for you to have. You might want to get rid of the isolates. just depends on what you want to do. If you do want to get rid of the isolates, um, I add this line of code, which is from the iGraph package, which is just I'm deleting all of the nodes where the degree is equal to zero, and then I'll just get rid of all of them so you can only see the ones that have connections. And then I'll spit out this plot. So you still have a couple people who are only tied to like one other person. Um, but it just gives you these two components in the network. And then, oops, sorry, question? Question? Yeah. Um, when it calculates numbers from zero to all those things out here, it includes the isolates from that, those calculations, correct? I mean, it's, it's yeah. deleting them visually, but it's still calculating them because of the attributes that it read from that, from that right? Like it's doing, if it calculates Mm -hmm. It's including all the isolates. If you keep them in, yes. So if you delete them from the graph object, it'll delete them from the node list and the edge list. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the, the statistics itself, I didn't change the graph object in here. I was just piping it through. Anything you pipe through doesn't save, um, just for the plot itself. But yeah, so if you, the isolates are important to your measures, then don't delete them. <laughs> Does that make sense? And you have to Exactly. So the way that I do it here, um, you could just create the graph object with only an edge list, but then you would have to add the attributes on later, which I found kind of finicky in iGraph and doesn't always work very well. Um, so the easiest way I found is to have the attribute list as well to add it in. The only issue with that, as I mentioned before, is that everyone in your edge list in the um, ego ID or the altar also has to be in the notes list. So if you have somebody like who wasn't there that day at school, um, who's in the edge list, you have to add them to the node list even if they have missing values on everything else, um, just to make sure they match. And you'll usually get an error if you don't have them with iGraph, saying like there's a node, there's a vertice that doesn't exist in the edge list, um, but we usually just kind of like add a row for them so they exist, um, so that we can create our graph after that. But that's where like some, of, you might get some missing data with those kids, um, or respondents where you have in their node attributes. Does that make sense? Okay, I think this is the last one I did just to show you how you can manipulate it a little bit. So um, as part of a kind of checking your work thing, I want to see if the graphs are plotting and kind of behaving as I thought they would. So because this is a school network and we know that uh, kids tend to be friends with people of the same sex or gender as them, um, I decided to uh, color the nodes by sex, whatever they reported in the survey. And so I added these um, arguments to the geom node point side where um, just basically filling the circles um, by, I think it's coded as one or two here. Um, it has, again, the same syntax and kind of logic as ggplot2, where if you're taking, um, if you want to color something by a variable in the data, it has to be in this aesthetic argument um, in order for it to work. And the shapes argument, um, for some reason also is necessary if you want to use the fill argument. Um, there's a list of like 20 something shapes online. Um, 21 is the circles, which is the most common shapes for nodes. That's usually what my default is. And so here um, sort of plays out kind of how I would think you see a lot more people um, of the same sex close to each other, um, sort of kind of clicks of people of the same sex. Um, and then it adds a legend automatically, which you can also edit later the same exact way you would edit a ggplot2 um, legend as well. Um, so those are the kind of checks I do when I'm like checking my work here. The visual I think is the most useful way to make sure that everything's looking as it should look. Um, but yeah, and I think that's all I have for everyone. Yeah, thanks. And if you're oh. wondering, the, uh, the other Yeah, so the, I think in middle school they couldn't nominate people across grade or, so, or no, the junior in high school. Okay, yeah. So a lot of the, some of the adolescent data sets and, and other ones that I work with, they either 
Sometimes they can't nominate across grades, so you'll see these really distinct um, clumps that probably aren't real, but <laughs> um, separates them out. Somebody, was there another question that I heard? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. No, so this was just, just for an example show, but the iGraph package, so I use the like graph from data frame function. You can, there's also a graph from matrix function as well. The iGraph package, um, not, Lots of our packages are not well documented because um, it's open source, but the iGraph package is really well documented, at least in my opinion. Um, they have a Python and an R version, so if you can find, we can probably send around to you, I'm sure there's a link somewhere. Um, the iGraph package will tell you all the different ways you can make the graph object as well. Um, you can also, if, you, if, you, if your brain works more in edge list than in matrices, you can also go from a matrix to an edge list and then cut it in that way. Um, it just really depends on the personal preference. Any other questions? Ready?
or as any of these file formats, so a PNG, a JPEG, or a PDF, um, say that your network data is large and you want to have like a larger plot, you're able to resize the size of your plot as well, especially if you have like a larger screen. And then you're able to remove isolates should you have a network with a lot of isolates. Um, and you can also remove duplicated edges if you think that's skewing the visualization for some reason. We support a bunch of the different native iGraph layouts, so this is the one we choose immediately. I think that this doesn't look that great, but if you want it, you know, you can. Uh, for some reason, there are cases where that might be useful. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Jim had mentioned that before manipulating your data thing, that he selected a node and moved it. And I know there's some um, software packages that let you do it, like Aura, but I know like in R, when I populate those, I don't have that sort of control. Can you do that with this visualization? Yep. Yeah. Uh, you can turn on interactivity, and you can move those around. Yeah. Uh, I will say that <laughs> I don't know if that's what's really exciting. Someone that feature badly. Yeah, yeah, that was a. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I just use a package that I particularly like that allows you to do that. It's called Biz Network. If anyone's interested in it, it's probably been my favorite visualization package that I've used. It's super easy, and everything that you can see here is built using that one package. Anyways, uh, you are also able to color your network based upon all of the community detection modules that we mentioned. So those have already been run when you come to this visualization tab. Or you can use some of the variables that were available to you. So let's say we want to color by religion. Um, you can choose a bunch of different color palettes, and it'll color that. Religion might not be the most effective. I mentioned that this was a village in India. Pretty much everyone is Hindu, so that's what you're seeing here. Uh, Cast probably looks like a better option. Um, so yeah, then you can choose a bunch of different color palettes and we are in the process of adding more as well. Um, you're also able to change the size of your nodes. So I mentioned that this is age right now. You can also choose degree or a couple different centrality measures and you can change the scale on that. So again, there's a bunch of different options for people that are not that familiar with R or people that don't necessarily want to uh, write a bunch of lines of code to be able to visualize their data easily and effectively. And also the nodes. <laughs> uh, we also have those network metrics that I mentioned outputted for users, so the system level measures, the node level measures. Uh, we have a statistics tab that just allows you to select any of the variables in that node measures data frame and just look at them um, in sort of a summary page, visualize from 10 to 100 entries. I am in the process of adding um, what will hopefully be like some summary like visualizations, like just simple like line plots or bar plots that make it easy for users to look at the distribution, but that is currently in the works. And then we have the ability to run some of the advanced network analysis um, modules that we mentioned we had access to earlier. We have a QAP function that Gabe wrote, which I'm still in the process of getting to play nice with this. And then we also have that role detection function that I mentioned earlier. So let's go ahead and run the cluster again. Um, you can choose your minimum number of clusters, your maximum number of clusters, just in the same way that you could natively in the R markdown that I showed you. Choose the minimum number of nodes per cluster, and then you can run your role detection and get all those visualizations outputted as well. And again, we have all of the different heat maps, the sociogram, and the summary uh, visualizations as well. So again, that whole workflow is meant for someone who is a lot more comfortable using a graphical interface rather than using some of the code that we've shown you here. Yes? I believe we are in the process of adding that right now, but you yeah, can probably speak to that's, that. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't much, had much discussion about egocentric data, but with, uh, I'm currently working with a lab group that's working with tons, so my head's in that way. I know that incorporating support for two mode networks was one of our next big moves in the next few months. Yep. For ego network, you can kind of manipulate it, you know, to, to make it work in your favor, right? If you loop it, you could loop this over each of the ego networks. If you use something like Igor, yeah. uh, so exactly. So I've done that with that, okay. and it works perfectly. Yeah. yeah. I've used like some of these functions and loops as well, and it's super easy like to have one function loop through and analyze a bunch of different networks in, in a lump sum. I will also add a uh, current limitation, but one we can sort of work around. We don't explicitly support dynamic networks or like networks across you know, multiple time periods. If you didn't have a relational net and you set the tie type argument as your wave of data, it would effectively process you know, your, your temporal network. 
but we do still need to kind of explicitly acknowledge dynamic networks and also make it play nice with multi-relational if you're brave enough to deal with that much, much complexity. So that's, that's not our, uh, our you know, issue. Yeah. Uh, so that was all of the analysis functions that we wanted to show you. I'll go ahead and talk about next steps, and then I think that Gabe will wrap us up. So, um, so in the future, we plan to add to that dataverse that Gabe mentioned at the beginning a bunch more data ourselves as our group. We have a lot more village data from these villages in northern India um, and other types of village networks. I think that even just you know if we don't get a lot of data from others, we want to make it as comprehensive as possible. We also want to again. Um, expand our analysis to bipartite dynamic networks. We want to increase the number of formats that you can read in using that net read function, which will then also increase the number of formats that play nicely with NetWrite and the Shining Visualizer. Um, we're going to implement a champ community detection function that Peter is working on. I don't know if he's talked to you about that yet, but you will hear about it. Um, it should make community detection, I believe, more accurate and just more comprehensive in general. And then we're going to add additional analysis modules to both NetWrite and the Shiny app and then just continue to add features that make the Shiny app easier to use. And I'm not going to lie, it is buggy at times, so I would like to fix that as well. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it back to Gabe to just wrap us up. You want the thank microphone you. back here? No, for one, for one, for one side. Um, thank you. Yeah, and isn't it cool that Kieran developed that almost an entire Shiny app with one other person yeah. kind of starting it? But that's it. This is really, really cool. So I just wanted to finish up by saying the, the point of this, just to summarize, is we're not reinventing the wheel and we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. We're trying to take the best things that already exist and make them as smooth as possible for people who are really engaged with network data, right? Um, and we think that this is the exact crowd and we're the exact people who, who can take advantage of the changing research landscape and try to orient it in a direction um, that's more shared, where more people are involved, more data is being shared, and the quality overall is, is good. Um, and for that, please deposit your data with us. <laughs> uh, you know, we'll, we'll work with you. We're, we're, we're ironing out the kinks, um, but we're coming really, really close to being able to start that process. And also, please use our tool and then go to our GitHub and post an issue, right? I mean, pro tip, there's not a lot of people using this, so if you have something you particularly want, get in on the ground floor, because then the developers are like, oh yeah, sure, I'll put that in first. So <laughs> it's kind of a good move to get in on the ground floor on this one. And so you can go to this QR code, it'll take you to the website where you can grab this code here. And we also have a poster uh, out for the rest of the conference that will you know, kind of describe some of the things we've described here. And come to any one of us uh, if you want some help installing or if you have further questions. Let me click on the, the website just to, yeah. yeah. It'll take you to our, to our uh, beautiful Web 1.0 DNI website. Yeah, um, and all the code to install both the IdeaNet package and the uh, IdeaNet visualizer are here as well. So we can open up to questions if there's any remaining. Yes? So um, do you have any relationships with like NIH or some of these other data sharing um, mandates that are coming out now for grants? And, you know, I have attempted to share network data on some of those. Um, So this is a question for Jim. So, we it's not coincidental that we've developed this at the same time that the NIH data sharing requirements have now become a mandate. Um, so our goal is to be able to make this compliant, to be able to allow investigators to be completely compliant with their NIH and NSF data sharing requirements. And so um, effectively, you should, at the end of the day, you should be able to hand us your data um, and write in your data sharing plan for your grant proposal posting my data with IdeaNet, um, and we, that's why we set it up to be um, uh, an IRB compliant. So um, right now, if you have data that you need to share, and you can tell your program officer that you're going to share your data as part of getting funded at NIH, we can house that data, and we can house it and share it. So it's not just a repository for audit purposes, it's a repository for actual data and for use purposes. And so I think that's the and those scheduled mandated time points where you have to do it throughout the year, that's synchronized to the you would, We can work with you on any set you want. So, they, 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 so if, if you have a particular schedule you need to do it on, that's fine. For most people, it's a, at the end of in the grant, in the life cycle. Kind of thing. But if you have a different cycle, you can sort of work with that. And then they're making you upload each, every four months or something, you have to upload more. And then update and upload and update and upload. <coughs> 
Yeah, so some of this will be, as we go along, we'll learn from what people need to do. And so hopefully those user agreements, those auto templates will get better. Yeah. Good hour, please. It does, it does. I, so somebody jump in if I'm incorrect here, but my understanding of this is built on R, right in the background, it's just this same R language. Um, in iGraph slash ggGraph, the XY coordinates of your nodes, I don't think will stick around if you're running some sort of algorithm afterwards, like some diffusion algorithm. So I do not believe that's gonna be a problem, but, it's, but if I'm wrong, then jump in on that. Yeah, specifically on like the visualization that I showed, you can drag it around, um, but if you like generate a new net layout, um, or if you just like close out of that and rerun it again, the position does not stick around. If you save it, um, it will save with where you've moved the nodes. So you can like export the visualization with the position you've chosen, um, but should you like run the code again, um, that layout will not, it will go back to the original layout with the node not having been moved, if that makes sense. Cool. And we really are serious. We want to get all the. We would love you to use this, and we would love any suggestions you have for things to include. It's a, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but maybe not too much to say we're truly really trying to put ourselves out of business. I mean, this is the goal of this tool is that essentially instead of everyone having to spend a week learning network analysis to be a social networks and health researcher, you can focus on the health and you can leave the network side of it to this tool. So yep. um, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's more in that direction than not. And we want it to be smart and done well, which means we need people like you to tell us how to do it and what it is you want. Um, and we'll put it in the tool. So that's where we're at. Uh, but again, a big, big appreciation to the RAs um, for doing this. Congratulations to Kieran for graduating again. <laughs> So there we're at. Um, the next item on our schedule is what we're fondly referring to as Stump the Chumps. And so the notion of the Stump the Chumps, um, for those of you that are all NPR nerds, um, is that you, know, we, you ask questions that we may or may not be able to answer and that we might or might not agree about. And we would kind of, we had in our minds these would be themed by whatever the day was. And today would be computation issues and programming issues and things like this. And um, you know, the next day would be data or what have you. But of course, if you have questions, ask your questions. And we'll do our best to answer them uh, as we can go. Um, that said, no one sent me a pre question, so we're just really are in an open forum. So it um, uh, really is uh, sort of an open QA section for the next bit, and uh, we will open it up there. So, Questions or comments about using R, about using networks, um, any of the intro stuff, that's where we'll start now. Please. Yes, and for those of you who couldn't hear it, the, the, question, the, the statement that which implied the question, I think, was um, it seems like over the last few years we've been an increasingly um, a quantitative approach to network science and not as much in the substantive and qualitative side of network analysis. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. I think that um, part of this growth we saw in the 1990s, this rapid push in networks and health, as was not un, you know, it was coincidentally um, the same time that physics moved into the field and the computational power went nuts. And so you add to that 
an increased interest in the web as a network, which happened in the early 90s. And all of these same things came together to create the network science branch of social network analysis. And these two have now actually, in some ways, formally split. There's now a journal called Network Science that is primarily run by computer scientists and physicists, and a journal called Social Network Analysis, which is, just a, which is primarily social, social scientists. And the two connections of those are um, uh, you know, not as strong as they might want them to be. I think that um, there is now, the good news is, on the side of it, there is a session every year now at the social, at the social network analysis meeting, the Sunbelt meetings, um, devoted to mixed methods and qualitative methods um, in, in social network analysis. And I encourage people to, you know, if you're interested in those kind of things, to do it. Um, but more generally, I think that um, a lot of the work that's done in the network science, the, the, the promise of that line of work and Peter, you should correct me, and others in the room that have thought about this. Um, a, a lot of the promise that, or the excitement about that early work was everything's a graph, the same hammer will fit all of these nails, and it's like everything's scale free, everything's small world, everything, you know, I can just fit the Laplace in and I'm done. And like everything is, is, can be sort of fixed with the same tool because I'm willing to squint enough to make them all look as if they're the same. Um, and I think that the, the shine kind of fell off that promise for those of us that are in the actual applied side of the, of the research world. Um, and uh, I think we're starting to see maybe a little bit more interest in sort of going back to looking a little more in depth. At least I hope so. Um, but I think that I would, so to my sort of stump the, 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 stump the jumps prediction from this is I think that this, it, it, um, that sort of one size fits all network science model is not as popular as it once was, and um, the network science people who are really interested in doing that kind of work are now focusing almost entirely on non-human networks. So they're looking at social media graphs, they're looking at um, sort of text networks, they're looking at things that are really big, and they're looking at the properties of these really big graphs that are perhaps not of interest to those of us who are in health in themselves as networks. Is that a fair statement? Someone else want to say? Other people had experience in this? Please, let them. No, I was going to ask another question. Fair enough. Did they do that? That was a great answer. Well, and I think that, yeah, well, there we go. But I do think that, you know, I think a lot of us who are, we, it, it, it just takes a lot of time and energy to, um, to learn these methods, which is part of what prompted idea net. Um, and you can really get sucked into it, right? Once you get to, like, all the time and effort it takes to learn this, it's kind of like, um, it's like when you buy a new car and you see that same color car everywhere, right? Now that once you learn how to do this analysis, you want to do it over and over again and you sort of forget maybe why you're doing it. Um, and so I think it's part of the reasons that it's really valuable to have multidisciplinary teams where you're working with people who are, you know, you have somebody who's crunching the numbers and someone who's actually talking to humans and someone who's reading the reports and seeing what the outliers are. Like that kind of team science allows you to not get stuck in that bubble as well. So I think it's really important. It's so exciting to see, you know, all these, these ways of doing multi networks or multi relational, as you said, like having that all there and the real actual complexity of the actual world. <laughs> I'm curious if there's any thinking now about how do you move out in a way, like, so you have a person and their ties, and then you have um, those people connected to other people. So the question is, just can people hear it? I always repeat it briefly, I think. So the, um, the question is, are there ways, I'm going to restate your question in a way that I think I can answer, which is a trick. Um, so you should, you should correct me if I do that incorrectly. 
Um, but I, but the, the question that I want to answer that I heard you say is, is there, um, are there tools for embedding ego networks within larger system dynamics of global networks um, that actually take seriously the different roles that people are engaged in? And levels of analysis. And, levels of analysis. and I think the answer is theoretically yes, practically no. Um, I think that there are lots of us that want to do something like that, and we can see the promise of these systems, but there's very little off the shelf to do it. And so if you want to do that, you largely got to do it yourself. Now that said, I think the way the tools are now available to do it yourself in ways that were unavailable even 10 years ago. So I think you can get there, but I don't know of many people that are doing it very well. Jimmy, do you have? I mean, I think on the science side, I think the multi I think what you would want to do, I mean, I can imagine, like, I'm going to take your example of uh, you have a hospital system, you have a patient, you have their doctors, you have their nurses, and what you would like to know is, like, is the doctor embedded, you know, is the, is the doctor central in the physician network or peripheral? Is the nurse, like, stressed out and strained because they're bridging two different, you know, work, work sides of a, you know, a feud in the nurse set? And do all of those other kinds of role strains that are engaged on the physician side and the staff side, how does that interact with the care that's given to the patient? And does that look different from what the patient's point of view to do, you know, from one patient to another? Because it might be that I have to work with a nurse with this patient that I dislike, but I have to work with a nurse that I like on another patient. And so the same nurse is going to give different care to this patient because of the way they're embedded in that system. So I think that kind of model, I know you work well enough to know that, that where, where that question might be coming from. I think that kind of a model, I, we could see how to model that. I can tell you that I can model each of these layers in a particular way. I can talk about the role strain of nurses within the nursing network and the physicians within the physician network, and we could put this together. But I know of no paper that's done that yet, right? So that kind of a model that sort of systematically does that is a lot easier to describe qualitatively than it is to actually collect the data and do realism. Um, and so I think it's a great direction we should go, right? And I hope that many of you do that. But I, I think that it's a big ask. Uh, it, yes. I don't think that's a bad. I, I don't think that's a bad thing. <laughs> no, I I, th I I do want to be careful. I mean, this is one of the things that comes up, like when someone is talking about moving nodes around on a graph and sort of you know whether or not you get a score or not. There's a we have been beat for years. Like in order to get to where you are now, you've gone through your undergraduate stats class, your algebra class, your graduate statistics class, your econometrics course gone through your scientific methods and your ethics course, everyone said, follow the rule, use this benchmark, don't do anything stupid or don't do anything dangerous. And by default, then, we all want to make sure that what we're doing is sanctified by someone else who said it's the right thing to do, right? Um, what I'm telling you is that most of those kinds of sanctification moments don't exist in networks, right? This is a very, this is, this is a field as a whole that you can do stupid things and you can do wrong things, but you know, it's, it's really, if you're looking for, you know, an answer that says, that, you know, 0 0.05 or above, that's not what it is. So it is storytelling. And I think that's great, <laughs> right? I actually think that's a feature, not a bug. Um, because we have so many, the, the advantage of having all these different, the advantage, how, how to say this better? By virtue of the fact that you have to reduce an n-dimensional object into two dimensions, that gives you, you know, n minus, you know, all but two of those dimensions to choose, right? That you, there are the ways, the ways in which you do that. Now you can do that smartly, more or less smartly, and you need to have a reason for why you're doing it. But I think that as an expert in your area, that's good, right? And so what I would do is say, all right, I know that my nurses are embedded in a network, and that that, that embeddedness is affecting the way they provide care to their patients. And so I might say, well, I can't collect the full nurse ne network data. I don't have the money or the budget to do it. But I can ask those nurses to report on their role strain. I can ask them to report on a 
social capital index that says, you know, of the types of people you could interact with on a daily basis, how often do you interact with physicians, staff members, you know, other nurses, and so forth, and are those um, interactions positive or negative? And with you know eight questions, I could get a, an index that, that sort of roughly captures the role strain of nurses in the professional setting. It's not going to be as good as a full multi-level role analysis might be, but it'll get us a little ways there. Um, or I can invent you know a couple of eager RAs to um, uh, you know spend the, spend a night in the uh, ER watching the nurses you know go back and forth. Right. And so there's lots of ways of getting at the same idea. Is what I'm saying, and I think that. Um, some of that you would, I would think would be the gold standard of that kind of you know, relational embeddedness model um, is really expensive and <laughs> really time consuming. But I think there's a, you know, there's, a, there's a Cliff Notes version of that that'll get us something good that's not like that. Please, I'm not sure who was first. To piggyback off this scenario that you're talking about, so one of the things I'm thinking about is like the age of problem with closeness and high strength and how we actually measure that um, would you recommend or say absolutely not to taking some of the metrics on centrality for the, like, say, nurse network and using that to weight the, their connections with, say, someone from the doctor network and then the components of the doctor network to weight that individual node and thus the way that their, their edge is formed? Mm -hmm. Like, you could do, like, a conventional, if you wanted to get real crazy, right, to have that matrix that shows. Right. So just for the people at the back, they, here is, is it possible to effectively use the network metrics to weight the edges in a recursive manner across different types of networks? And I think absolutely. Um, so for example, the, a, an, an interaction, the, the joke in the networks, right, is that um, uh, an ethnographer will spend years describing what a, what a social network analyst will turn into a coin flip, right? And so I'll say this tie is on or off, right? It's binary or present, as a, and all the richness of it goes away. And the, the, the reason that might be a not unreasonable trade-off is that what you gain in, 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 tr in trade is the relations all around it. And so I can say, all right, so this relationship is there, but it's a relationship between someone with really low centrality and someone with real high centrality. Well, that probably means that this is a relationship characterized by an inequality of power, and differential status, and so forth. And so you could then partial out the meaning of the edges by virtue of the mixing across dimensions. Now, whether or not you do that formally with a k-dimensional clustering or whatever, or what you actually sort of described intuitively was the eigenvector centrality, right, um, on the edges as opposed to on the, the nodes, right? And so there's a whole new class of centrality measures that are applied to edges as opposed to nodes that you could use in that kind of situation to characterize the relationship. And you could then cluster around the nodes that this node is centered on different types of relations. Like, that's a way to do that as well. So, so yes, the answer is. And I think that the problem is, is that our canonical analyses have been pretty, pretty vanilla with that kind of thing. There's a, there's a amount of creativity that goes into doing that that just people have bothered with. And I, and I think it's because, um, you know, I haven't even specified why, but like, imagine you do that and you, and you find nothing, right? And so there's a, there's a real risk with doing a lot of these kinds of things. You go in all gun-fired, you know, ready to go, and you do some crazy like rescaling of something, you spend hours doing it, and at the end of the day, you've, you know, you've shown that Democrats don't like to co-author bills with Republicans, and it's like, <laughs> there we go. So you need, to, you need to make sure that the thing that you're doing has some, some you know, that the juice is worth the squeeze, if you will. And I think that in some settings, and so like hospital settings, I think like hospitals and nursing homes and schools, part of the reasons that we there's a practical reason we study these areas is because you know, they have a nice boundedness to them so we can actually get into the setting. But also there's a lot of, um, you know, sort of, it's a, it's, a, it's a setting that's pregnant with relational dynamics, right? There's a lot of opportunity there for tension and for you know, power dynamics and for differences that wouldn't be obvious due to just the fact that someone has an attribute attached to them, but the relational sort of setting. This is why, you know, Scrubs is a good show, right? It's because like hospitals are weird places where things happen. This is why half of the soap operas are in hospitals because there's a natural drama that's going on. Um, so we can play with that, and I think that we should.
please. So I guess it also a spin off of that, but in a much more simplistic my way of thinking. So with asynchronous temporal networks, kind of like you were talking about with um, you know the dynamic nature of if sexual partners, but it really was temporal. If you hit it at this time, it was going to cause this, but if you did it, is there any way to do networks where you're actually picking up signals? If you hit the signal at the time, can you do almost like if you throw a rock into a pond and you start to pick up the ripples, and then you measure the ripples and you see where it waxes and wanes, and then you can look at the attributes and how they sort of fit into that? Uh, so just repeat the question. Is there a way to, I'm going to try to repeat this question is the way I think you're asking. So I think that what you're asking is, can you take a, a time slice of the data you had and a set of outcomes that should have been generated through a network process and from that infer the dynamics of the network? Is that fair, close? Okay, so I think, I think the answer is sort of. Um, and there's a, one, the one area where people are working really hard on this question is phylogenetic trees. And so people are trying to say, you know, essentially does the disease, where, where did it start and where did it end, or how did it get passed from one critter to the next? Well, they can do that by looking at the genetic similarity and there's only a certain branching structure that's gonna fit with that properly. And so I think there are some kinds of, of elements that allow us to do that. We tried to infer some of this in some work I did with a large multinational security organization um, to figure out essentially where secrets might go. Uh, and so you would know if a secret was leaked to one place, that it couldn't have come from some other place, and so that means that some other, you know, by, by virtue of who had access to what, you could know perhaps who would have had access to it initially, right? So there's some of those sort of forensic things you can do with networks. Um, I don't know that it's, um, I think that the kinds of classes for which that is viable and useful in the health context is gonna be a, a little hard to know. Now I think that one of the, so, so I think that um, from the, the pure sort of forensic side, it's a hard, it's a really hard nut to crack. It turns out though that you can do the, what I would argue be the next best thing for most of us in the, in the health side of the research world, which you wouldn't take to court forensically, but you could do to learn something about the world, which is to ask yourself essentially, is there a set of timings or relational patterns on the network that is consistent with the kind of outbreak and the kind of feature that you see? So imagine that I'm looking at you know, a chlamydia outbreak in Raleigh. And I want to know, you know, essentially from what I've seen at the clinic, what kind of sexual turnover would have to happen in this setting to carry that kind of disease spread. Well, I can, I can dial the concurrency knob up on and off and say, all right, you know, if, if everyone was, was, if all relations were completely concurrent, everyone would have chlamydia and it can't be that bad. If they were truly monogamous, no one would, so it's not that. And I have to crank it up to a certain level, given the known what I know, to see that it's there. And so what you'll see when Sam Jensis presents um, at the end of this week is that um, the EPI model tool has the capacity to change the amount of concurrency, for example, in the network, or you can change the start and end time of relationships. And so you can do it empirically by saying, I'm gonna fit a model to the data that says how often do people start relations, how often do they end relations, and how are those things linked? Because it turns out that not everyone waits to start a relation until after they've ended a relation. And so you can separate those things. And you can use these separable relational models to figure out the difference in those two dynamics, and that will lead to a, a knowable distribution of overlap, which will then be consistent with a spread. Now, will it be the exact spread you saw? Probably not, right? And so you couldn't say that this person is basically zero and this person is basically one, but you know that in this kind of setting, you have to have at least 10% concurrency for an outbreak to be as big as we see. So those are the kinds of questions we can ask with follow-up. Does that help? Yeah, and so, can I ask a follow-up question? Absolutely. <laughs> if you turn that concurrency knob, mm -hmm. but uh, there's a big chunk of that data that's missing, yes. is there a fair algorithm that you can apply to it for replicating data long enough to be able to infer something from the concurrency that you're switching? If you're willing to make the homogeneity assumption. Mm -hmm. And so if you're, willing to say, if you're willing to assume that the data I can't see is reasonably like the types of data I see, then yes, that's a problem we can solve. If the kind of data that I don't see is fundamentally different than the data I see, then we're out of line. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Yes, I, um, thank you so much for taking this. This is absolutely incredible. Um, I have a question that I get questioned by in, um, reviewers from on papers, and that's the generalizability of our findings and trying to like apply it to a larger setting. I was just wondering if you had any good yeah. responses to that. The question is, um, given that reviewers um, often ask when you do a network study, how generalizable is your, are your results to something else? And I think embedded in the question, having gotten this review many times myself, is that um, part of the problem with one of the sort of 
problems with the network analysis is like what's the actual end you're dealing with? So if I have you know a network of 10,000 you know people that go to a hospital or all patients at Duke University Hospital, you think that's a really big end, but it's really one network, right? So I have a case study of one network with 10,000 people in it. So what am I generalizing to, right? The other side of this is that the network assumption is that you have the population if you're doing a socio-centric network, and so. It's not, you don't have a sample, right? You don't have a random, you certainly don't have a random sample. And so what are you generalizing to? And I think there's, there's two kinds of answers to that question. The one is, you're doing a, if you have one network, you have one network, it's a case study. You just have to be upfront and honest about what it is. And you make the case that this case is representative of some class as best you can. So if I'm dealing with electronic medical records at Durham, I think that Durham is a pretty representative, you know, New South City. It's got a, a certain the racial heterogeneity, has a certain income mix, it has a certain you know, sort of mix of you know, professionals versus not. It's also really weird in the sense that it's dominated by a university and by Glaxo so is fine, and has seven or eight other biotech firms, right? So there's a really strong inequality that wouldn't be represented in, say, Charlotte or you know, Greensboro or somewhere like this. And so just be up, whenever you're doing a case study, you have to be upfront about what your case is. And the advantage of multiple networks, like when you have a whole collection of schools or something, is that in the for that level. But within the network, I think that you do have the ability to say that the social process you're studying is generalizable, at least within the context of your setting. And so there's very, there's, unless you have some really weird reason to think that someone with heart disease in Durham is fundamentally different than somebody with heart disease in Charlotte, then that social process of the way that hospitals and doctors work in Durham should be generalizable. Now there's a technical answer, so I think that's the substantive answer. So when, I, so when I write these reviews, this is the reason that the response to reviewers becomes 30 pages long. But so I, I usually would write back to the reviewer the first the substantive case, which is that this is the, um, you know, the thing that I'm trying to generalize to. And this is how my case is like that versus not like that. And then the technical answer is that whenever you're, you're generalizing, the, the thing you're doing statistical inference to in networks is not from a population, to, from a sample to a population, but from one example of a class of networks to that randomized class of networks. And so the case, the argument is, is that you could imagine that the same social process would happen again with more or less noise when you see the same result. And so is my result um, typical of a randomized process or a systematic process? And so I can, I can increase or decrease the amount of random noise I add to it and say whether it's, it fits to that or not. So most of the times when we do a statistical model of networks, the inference isn't, um, you know, the standard statistical power sampling. You know, is my sample representative of the population? It's is the pro is the observed outcome a result of a random process or a not random process? Does that help? But it's a it's it's an it's an honest problem, and this is why the you know the the, the network. You know, we, we spend so much time collecting network data, and it's so intense that you end up with an N of one. <laughs> it's like, you know, it, it, it is a, every, every network is a special jewel. And part of what we hope to get out of the idea net is that we, we can actually, over the last you know, 40 years, um, the field has collected thousands of network cases. And each of those network cases is sitting on a five and a quarter inch dip drive in somebody's <laughs> drawer somewhere, and no one's touched it in 40 years. We want you to talk to your emeritus faculty and say, send those data to Moody. You'll find a, a reader somewhere in the library and get it on a machine and it'll get people using it again. Because then you can say, well, my data set is you know, pretty much the same in terms of its density, degree distribution, centralization, and so forth as every other data set in the idea that archive. Um, and it fits for exactly what we'd expect. And therefore, my test about this is not suspect. Right? So if we can build that kind of corpus, we get that kind of data set up and running, then that means that essentially all of us have the ability to say that our case contributes to a collection of cases as opposed to being a tool all by itself. So then the question is, is that going to be an upcoming feature of IDNet where there'll be a metric saying how compatible that network is with the rest of the networks? That wouldn't be a hard thing to do. I mean, it's, it, it, as the corpus grows, saying where it fits in the distribution of, of networks of the same size is pretty easy to do. So yeah. I like that idea. Thank you. Someone write that down. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're done. Going once. All right.
tomorrow the other Trumps are going to come up and help us with this, with this ad. All right, folks, um, have a good evening, fellows and returning fellows. We have um, uh, an event this evening. Otherwise, we'll see everyone in the morning at 9 a.m.